Okay. All right. Thanks. Call to order, special called meeting, Friday, April 14th, 2023. Roll call, Ms. Walker. Mr. Sutherland. Ms. Brown. Mr. Carter. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Teeter. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Knight. If you would uh, stand us, uh, stand. Who's going to be missing prayer? to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first item um, <clears throat> this morning is to approve our minutes for April 10th, 2023, regular meeting. Motion. Roll call, Ms. Walker. Mr. Carter. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Teeter. Mr. Knight. Okay, next up for consideration, presentation of Nicholasville's destination assessment. Mr. Roger Brooks here this morning. Thank you for yes. coming and uh, we're excited to hear what you have to say. Great, well thank you mayor, thank you commissioners, almost said council. <laughs> um, it's been great to be here. I gotta tell you, I'm here with my wife, Jean. Go ahead and stand up back there. Um, you can't, we've been secret shopping you. We have been here since Sunday, last Sunday. And you cannot secret shop an area without a woman. They see things totally different than us guys. So between us, we have been, we've had a great week exploring Nicholasville. And so I'm going to tell you what we saw and what we did. And by the way, if you see, feel free to take pictures of this. Um, I will be providing this physical presentation to Darren. He's been our contact through this whole process. Um, and I'm going to start with, we have three chapters in this. And I want to talk about the future of cities. And I have keynoted at the Kentucky League of Cities two or three times, including in 2019. Of course, you know what happened the next year. We all got shut down. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the future of cities, and then I'll get into this whole assessment thing. Is first of all, one thing that's really, community development is now leading economic development. Everything has changed. And for the very first time in US history, and this started about seven or eight years ago, um, jobs are going where the talent is or where the talent wants to be. It was never like that since our founding. Wherever the jobs were, people moved to the jobs. That has changed. And so for the very first time, community development, which is quality of life, is now leading economic development, tourism development, downtown development. And so you got to welcome you to the age of placemaking. And so we're going to concentrate a little bit on that today. And by the way, Every single elected official, from the President of the United States to school board presidents to you as commissioners, mayors, is to improve the quality of life for your citizens. And so I would say every city, the mission is to become the most desirable place to live in Kentucky or, you know, in, in um, central Kentucky or anywhere. That is your goal. And if you do that, the jobs are going to come, the investment's going to come, because that's where the workers want to be. So that has changed everything. The second thing is you got to attract millennials. Hate them or love them, millennials are now largely in their 30s, early 40s, very late 20s, but yeah, there we go, mayor. Yes, right there. Exactly. And, and um, so you've got to cater to the millennials. They are now the future. It is the biggest generation in American history, bigger than the boomers, and, um, and they are also the best educated generation in U.S. history. They are the most diverse generation in U.S. history, and they support it and love it. And there are now more mayors that are millennials than any other time in US history. 
There are more mayors under the age of 40 now than any time in US history. They are civically minded. I was, a, I was part of the boomer generation. We were back in the late 60s. We're down with the establishment. Somehow we became the establishment and pretty well screwed it up. But this is so important. And since they're so civically involved, you've got to engage your millennials. They are now having families. The boomers are having their kids in their 20s. Millennials are having their kids in their late 30s, early 40s. They're better parents. Fathers spend twice as much time with their kids as previous generations. And so now that they, and by the way, they still like living in the suburbs. They still like, you know, they're not living in downtowns necessarily. And by the way, if you cater the millennials, you're going to get us boomers too. I always tell, I speak at colleges a lot, and I always say, you know, we like hanging out with you whether you like it or not. <laughs> and so, what are they looking for? And this is really important for Nicholasville, is all these organizations you see coming up on your screen got together and they started asking, they asked thousands of millennials across the country what their priorities were. And this is really in their ten, top 10 priorities. What are their priorities in deciding where they're going to live, where they're going to raise a family, where they're going to work or start a business? These are in order. And, and number one is they want safety, particularly for kids. That's number one is safety. And I felt, man, Nicholasville has it. It felt safe. We never felt uncomfortable. I thought that's good. So far, so good. They want low crime rates. They want walkable streets. They want crosswalks. They want safe neighborhoods. Number two is they want good education, particularly for kids. And that is going to be really important. And childcare. We tried to find childcare facilities. I'm sure they're here in Nicholasville somewhere, but we had a hard time finding daycare centers and stuff. And, and so that's going to be really important. Um, you know, things like libraries. And so what these people do, when the millennials are looking, they'll go right to the web and they'll do this. What did I put in there? Um, best schools in the Lexington, Kentucky area. This is how they decide where they're going to live. They might not know about Nicholasville or Wilmore or, or Jessamine County even. And I was glad to see when they Googled that, West, West Jessamine High came right up in the Lexington area. And so this is how they search. I mean, we even did other searches like, you know, some of the best schools near Jessamine County, you know, Wilmore Elementary School rated really high. This is how they're deciding where to live. And so they may be looking, best public elementary schools in Jessamine County. Now, I gotta tell you one thing, they don't really look for counties. Have you ever gone anywhere and said, let's go to this county? That is one thing that you're gonna hear me talk a little bit about that. I think Nicholsville, everything's about Jessamine County, Nicholsville is kind of second to the county. I'm going, no, 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 no. You're a big enough city now that you need it and that you're in Jessamine County, but you're Nicholasville, you're a standalone city. Because people are looking for cities. I looked for Jessamine just to see what it would say. Um, they'll go to niche.com, you know, and they rate every single school, A, B, C, D. Your schools rank well above average in Kentucky. They're not the best. Lexington schools are slightly higher than yours. And by the way, that does not mean that there's a problem with your educational. It's usually your demographic. That's usually how schools are. It's a, always a product of the demographic, but still good, better than better than average across the state. So that's number two. And so these are all the different things we'll look at, that they'll look at. Number three is they want to be in an engaged community. They want a sense of belonging. And that is where downtowns come in. And we're going to talk about downtown. And then number, they want diversity, they want it friendly, they want a strong community working together to make it better. I hope you have a young professionals group here in Nicholasville that are actually engaged in working with the city. Um, number four, they want some cultural depth, whether it's visual arts, performing arts, some culture, music on the streets, concerts, you name it. Once again, typically that's downtown. So you're seeing in the middle of what millennials want are all of these things. They want life after six o'clock, Nicholasville. 
The only place we can really find it is maybe go to Brandon Crossing. We certainly didn't find it downtown where the sidewalks roll up at about 455. And so number six on this list is they want top-notch recreation, surpassing other areas. And whether that is lakes, whether it's community parks, whether it is sports facilities, you name it. Number seven on their list is they want affordability. They don't want cheap, they still want quality, but they want to be more affordable. That's good for you as like a bedroom community. Um, you know, and, and that includes affordabilities for like business rents, if they want to start a business here, move a business here. Starter homes, move ups, you know, all the nice neighborhoods, all of those things, which I think you have. And number eight is health care for kids. And um, here's what's really interesting. By the way, when they talk about health care, they want clean air, clean water, less traffic, um, good education, farmers markets, local prudos, you know, family services, all those things. Number nine is jobs. You know what that means? If you have the first eight, they will want to move here and they will find a job here because they want to be here. This is what has changed. In previous generations, that was number one, not number nine out of 10. And number 10, by the way, is transportation. So whether it's trails, whether it is public transit, whether it is uh, school buses, you know, all of those types of things are part of transportation. And so the bottom line is quality of life is so great, we want to find a job there. That has changed everything. And remember, they're in the 30s now. They're just starting to have families. And they're, this is the time to cater to them. So in all your marketing, everything you do, cater to the millennials, you'll get everybody else. So number three, what about tourism? Because tourism is the front door to your non-tourism economic development. Anybody that's going to move a business here, all these people you see coming up on the screen or coming here first is what? A visitor. Is this the place they'd want to live? Their employees would want to live. Their clients would want to start a business. So tourism is the front door to your non-tourism economic development. It is part of economic development. And the top reason for people visiting for travel is visiting friends and family. And by the way, you have a service population, Nicholasville, of 50,000 people. I know your population is like 32,000, but you're the service area for 50,000. Beyond that, we're, you know, we're just going into Lexington. But there are, so you already have tourism, friends and family. When friends and family visit you, where do you take them? You keep them in Nicholasville, you take them to the Bourbon Trail, you take them to Lexington, where are you taking them? Number, second reason for travel is business. You know, whether it's corporate, whether we're road crews, construction crews, you name it, that's all part of business. And then leisure is the third most popular reason. That's visiting Camp Nelson and all of those leisure attractions. You have your state historic site, et cetera. When it comes to tourism, the average visitor is active 14 hours a day. They only spend four to six hours of the primary activity. How many hours can we spend at Camp Nelson? What else do you have for us, Nicholasville? And they will spend eight to 10 hours with complimentary activities. Otherwise, they're just gonna come here and leave and go back somewhere else. And 80% of the spending is with those complimentary activities. And the number one thing that they do is shopping, dining, and entertainment in a pedestrian-friendly setting. Think downtown Bowling Green, Berea, Paducah. I mean, I could keep going down. Um, uh, let's see, let's uh, try Bardstown. I mean, I could keep going down the list, all of those. And so that's really important. And then number four, downtowns are critical to your success. And so I'm going to talk about, about downtown. As a matter of fact, for site selectors, downtown is your litmus test. They'll come into the downtown, and the health of your downtown economically is how they're going to judge Nicholasville. I saw a lot of vacancies downtown. So you may say, well, that's really unfair. You're judging us by downtown. You know, you have a downtown that is probably the size you would normally see in a population of 3,000. 
And that's because you've grown so fast and so much. And they should be your best recruitment tool. Um, and then finally, they create a sense of place. They, it creates a sense of community. I always say that downtown should be your nucleus. And we're in the age of third places now. The first place is the place we live. It's our home. The second place is the place we work. The third place is the place we go to hang out. Starbucks built an entire industry on becoming a third place. It is the one thing that is sorely lacking in Nicholasville, that place to go hang out. And by the way, downtowns are an investment, not an, ex an expense. And then number five is the power of first impressions. Just like us, we came in just secret shop to you, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But 70% of retail sales come from curb appeal. We all travel. Have you ever said, that looks like a nice place to eat? We judge a book by the cover. We judge communities by the cover. So when we drove in on Sunday, we saw these signs and we went, yes! And we've seen them just about it. We've driven, we've probably driven five or 600 miles over this week. And, and we've seen all these signs. They all look good. They're all at good locations. And I thought that was excellent. It also showed us how big you are as a city in terms of geography. We looked at most of your schools. Well, I mean, we found grade schools. We found high schools. I think you have like four high schools. And we looked at those. They look good. You know, when it comes to 2015 state champions, don't ever let that go past 10 years. You know, but right now, seven years ago, hey, babe, you've been a state champion. But West Jessamine High looked great. And then our first impressions at downtown looked awesome, beautiful. Of course, Kentucky is famous for beautiful architecture in its downtowns. And, you know, so we went out and checked out things. I mean, this was pretty much, we went out there and checked out the, uh, the, the, um, all of Camp Nelson. And it was great. As a matter of fact, we even looked at pictures of Camp Nelson online, and the house was, had chip paint. We drove out there and said, this is freshly painted. They haven't changed any photography on the, on the National Park website yet. And, um, you know, we have, you have stunning countryside. I mean, we, one thing we notice right off is when you get close into the core area, you see Dollar General, Dollar Store, Dollar This, Dollar That. Kind of, and then you go out there and it's like, holy smokes, there's the money. You know, and so we notice that huge diversity there. So you're off to a good start. So I just wanted to wrap this little part. Community development is leading economic development. Attract, go for millennials. Tourism is your front door. It's a good way to pull people in. And then downtowns are critical. And then number five, first impressions are lasting impressions. So there's the whole first chapter. That's the setup. So what is this whole assessment that we've been doing? And I think Darren said he saw us at the Municipal League. I spoke, I keynoted at the Kentucky League of Cities in 2019. We talked a lot about downtowns and community development. And after that, we went and assessed Secret Shop to Ashland, Kentucky. And we've been here all week. I didn't meet Darren, who was our main contact, till this morning. So we came here just like any other person. We didn't talk to any, any one of your commissioners, the mayor. We had a couple of emails about location where we're meeting this morning, but we came in like anybody else. And so we have secret shopped you. Um, no heads up, they didn't say go see this, make sure you do this, nothing. And by the way, we have assessed more than 2,500 now communities around the world. In Kentucky alone, you know, we spoke in there, Governor's Conference on Tourism, and we've worked in all of these places you see coming up, and I know I'm probably missing some, um, you know. And as a matter of fact, one thing that was really interesting is we also secret shopped this town out on the Bourbon Trail. I went in there, and I started my presentation by saying, it's so good to be here in Lebanon. Instantly, a lady stood up and said, this is not the country, this is Lebanon. So the first thing I had to do is go onto YouTube and see how people pronounce Nicholasville to make sure they didn't shorten it down to Nicholsville. 
Seems to be a Kentucky tradition, shorten it down. And so we have worked through these. This assessment process, we looked at your marketing. Before we even came out, we looked at websites. Could we find information about Nicholasville? Was it good enough to close the sale? How did you stack up? There's a lot of great cities and towns that we could move to or go to in Kentucky. But what I'm really going to concentrate on is what we saw when we got here. Like your, on, your signage, gateways, your gateways are great, wayfinding, overall appeal, uh, the rule of critical mass, I'll explain what that is. Amenities like parking, rest, public restrooms, visitor information, all those things. What is there to see and do here? Um, and then, of course, customer service, cross-selling. And when we do this assessment, we wore three hats. So this is not just tourism. Is this a place we'd want to live, raise a family, or retire in? So wearing that hat, quality of life. Is this a place I would work in, invest in, or start a business in, or move a business to, and then as a place to just come and visit? And so our whole assignment with Nicholasville, with this, is this right here. What else could be done in Nicholasville to make it an even better place to live, work, and play. What else can be done? There is no looking back in this. There's, so I don't want anybody to say, well, we should have. He said you should have. There is no should haves. We don't know where you were last year. So this is for a fresh start. Here's where you are today from the eyes of an outsider with ideas on how you can make it better. And that brings us to our third chapter. And in this third chapter, I got five key things I hope you'll focus on. The first one is community development. You heard what I said about millennials and everything. And so I thought, we gotta look at all these of the schools, your healthcare, childcare, trails, recreation, all the things that were in their top, top five or six um, in the millennials. And of course your gateways looked great. We had no problem with there. The first thing we did when we drove into town is we went right to TripAdvisor and said, where should we eat? So we're here for lunch. So we went there, and of course, a lot of visitors, that's what we do, we go down there. And of course, the number one rest rated restaurant on TripAdvisor was Copper River Grill. So that's where we started. Now, we went in there, it was right around, they opened at 11.30, we got there like 11.35. We went in there, sat down, we were like the first customers in there, our waiter came over, and um, our server came over, and we talked to them, and, he, and I was carrying, I have a big, huge camera. I was carrying this big camera. And he said, what, what brings you here? And I said, well, we're just checking the area out. And I said, and he said, well, I grew up here. I spent my whole life here, but I just moved. And he was probably mid-30s. I just moved my family to Lexington because there's not enough to do in Nicholasville. This is the very first person we met in Nicholasville. He says, I love it here, it's beautiful, but you know, there's really nothing. I got, to, I think he has a teenage daughter and another one that's probably 10 or 11 years old, I can't remember their ages. And he says, but there's just really nothing here for us. I mean, we're, it's a growing population, but we, now we're in, so we moved to Lexington. He goes, he didn't want to do it. But he goes, there just wasn't enough here for us. I went, okay. But he did not talk down Nicholasville. So that was a good start, it was interesting. So then we came into downtown, we saw the courthouse, and um, the first, next thing we decided to do, okay, let's go find visitor information. So we Google visitor information, and it took us to this place right here where it says on both sides, no trespassing. I mean, number one, we're in the back side of like the, a county building or something. And, and I mean, this is just not the right place for visitor information. And so you're going to see a lot of these numbers. There's suggestions. There's no recommendations in this. I think it's presumptuous for me to come in and tell you, the city, what you should do when I never talk to you first. But you may say, well, that's a good idea. That, that, so these are suggestions that hopefully you'll implement or maybe you say, and by the way, there may be some things you're going to see this morning that you say, we're already working on that. Great, we don't know, but you've just been validated. 
And so we thought, and by the way, the door was locked. So we did find a place to park, and, and, we, and there's no parking there, so we parked back where the sheriff's vehicles are, the counties, um, and walked over there, and sure enough, it was locked. And then, you know, like the logos worn off the awning. So this is, remember, now we've been to Nicholasville for about an hour and a half now. And so we're going, okay, so how do we fix this? And so number two on this, well, could we add, could we add some visitor information here? So if the door's locked, we mount something there that might have some of these, you know, visitor guides like Visit Jesmond or Explore the Back Roads or, or whatever it is. And you can do something like this. That was in, I took that in North Platte, Nebraska. So you might have the Kentucky Visitor's Guide. You might have the, I think it's the Jessamine, Living Jessamine Magazine, and then maybe another brochure, which I'm going to tell you what you should have in your brochure. But you need to have places around where we can get visitor information 24-7. Okay, so if somebody's not there, we can still find it. So from there we said, aha, there's the Chamber of Commerce. So we thought, we'll go over to the Chamber of Commerce. Now, we walked up to the front door of the Chamber of Commerce, and this is what we saw. There's some trash there, a pile of leaves, because here's what happens to a lot of places in downtown. They come in the back door. They don't ever go out. The, they don't come in the front door. So we're there going through the leaves and the trash to come into the Chamber of Commerce. And those leaves, I'm sure, have been there for quite a while. But as we're walking downtown, you know, this is what we're seeing downtown. You know, I, I mean, we saw trash everywhere. This is just a few days ago. And so, remember, we judge the book by the cover. And we see things you don't see as locals. You, you would probably wouldn't even notice. And so we're seeing, you know, we're seeing flower pots that are dead. And I know we're just coming in spring. The trees are all leafing out. But heck, these things could be pretty even in the winter. Now, to the chamber's credit, when we walked in there, we met Charlotte that runs the visitor information for the county, for Jesmond County. Is she here? Oh, right there. There she is. So we met her. I did pronounce it right, didn't I? Okay, so she was in the Chamber of Commerce. Did you walk out the front door when you left? Did you tell them? Because we came back a couple days later and it was all swept up. <laughs> I went, yes, they got the message somehow. We didn't say anything. But she gave it, she was really great. And she says, yeah, I normally am over there, but she just happened to be in the chamber and she did a great job selling the area. We asked her, where should we eat? What should we do? And she came with some things that I think are really important that you're going to see. Um, so anyway, we was glad. It's still, a, you know, we st should start planning things like in early April, you know, um, and make it really look nice. So she did a really great job. So we're glad we ran into her there. And by the way, she told us that they're considering moving the visitor information over to the old jail. I, we never could find that. We know it's somewhere around there. But that'll be great, getting you out on the main area where we can find you. But that's what visitors will typically do. They'll go right to a chamber of commerce if, if they don't know where there's visitor information. Um, you know, the one thing we discovered about downtown was you go to court to atone for your sins with your attorney who you'll find downtown. Then you go to church downtown to repent for all of that. All in one location. It's really handy. So in downtown, we really saw it as Courthouse Square. I mean, no real reason to hang out there, no restaurants that we could find, no really anything. Um, and so we thought, okay, and by the way, we're staying at Brandon Crossing at the New Hampton Inn. Been open like, like two weeks. And so we're staying there, and then we knew instantly Brandon Crossing just killed off your downtown because that's where most of the restaurants are. You got all these attractions up there. You got lodging up there. You got apartments up there. You got everything is up there. However, it has no personality. It's all big box. It's all, you know, for the most part, chains, you know, and so that, but so that was bad. So we knew, man, we got it. What can we do? Um, up there, it's, you know, it's not pedestrian friendly. As a matter of fact, I was working this presentation yesterday. Jane went out for a walk. There's no sidewalks. There's no crosswalks. 
um, if you try to go across the street from, from the Hampton Inn over there and towards Asuka, you know, the Japanese Steakhouse, good luck. There's no crosswalks at any intersections. Um, not pedestrian friendly at all. So our first impressions. Downtown looks good, but it's missing most of the ingredients of a successful downtown. And we're going to get into that. The schools look great. We couldn't find any ch child care establishments. I'm sure they're here, but they were a little difficult to find or locate. Um, the library looked fantastic. Uh, we had an extremely difficult time finding any recreational assets. Um, and there is the library. I thought, wow, this library is really awesome. Um, your medical facilities, you know, you do have 24-hour, uh, this is it. We thought it was, a, for a city the size of 50,000, we thought you were a little underserved in medical. Um, of course, you're so close to, you know, Lexington is across the street now. It's not, there's no distance between the two. Maybe that's why. But they didn't look bad. Um, and then we noticed that there is a lot of money in this city and in the county. And this is near, what is it, Drake's, I mean, not Drake's, um, uh, Keen Run. You know, these 12,000 square foot type houses and everything, you know, and we thought, okay, there's a lot of money. One thing we noticed right off, Lexington money seems to be here, and for those people, there isn't much in Nicholasville for them. They're tied to Lexington. I mean, there wasn't really a lot of high end in Nicholasville that would cater to them as far as dining and all of those kinds of things. So you could tell that they're here, probably lower taxes than in Fayette County, I'm guessing. Um, but it didn't seem like there was much here because it seemed like most of your retail tend to be on the lower end. That's just our first impressions. Uh, the golf course, the clubs, I mean, they, they're, they're extraordinary. Um, I just thought, wow. And then there just wasn't much in the city to keep their spending locally. We just didn't see it. Too many dollar stores, Dollar General, Dollar Tree, strip-oriented retail, particularly downtown. And so here's what we thought. This was our first impression. Is it's a fast-growing bedroom community that has outgrown its quality of life assets. We looked at your demographics. I mean, you have, you're, you're one of the fastest growing cities in Kentucky. And yet you've got condos and apartments and houses and neighborhoods and everything that are growing so fast and your parks and stuff haven't kept up with it. It didn't seem like your quality of life assets have kept up with the growth of the city. So that's our first impression. Remember, we've done this in 2,500 cities. So... For instance, when we see all these places, if I was in a city, normally we would say, okay, if you're going to build all of these apartments, condominiums, whatever they are, you have to put in 20%. Where's the trails? If people are living here that are with families, where's the trails they can go on strollers? Where's the sidewalks to connect them to the retail in Brandon Crossing? So it didn't seem like we're building all this housing and everything, but we're not putting in any amenities. In most cities, you're required to put in some amenities when you do commercial or even residential developments. Usually it's like 20 to 30% of your land base is meant to provide amenities for your residents. So that was our first impressions. I don't know if we're right, if we're wrong, but that was our first impression. Number two, wayfinding. It was public parking, amenities, directional signage. Why is every road here like a state highway? I mean, this is us. We're like, ah! You know, downtown's a state highway, uh, you know, 27 business, 27. I mean, look at this. I mean, we we're like, holy smokes. We we're just all over the place with 68 and 27 and 39. And I mean, look at that. And so, you know, it's one thing about Kentucky, no city's built on a grid system. And so you need directional signage. Help us find stuff. And that is so important. I would make this the number one priority as a county. I would do it as a county with the city. Maybe Walmart's in there for a piece of this. 
Um, you need a wayfinding system. So it creates a much better visitor experience. And number two, visitors will learn about what you have. Here's what you have to understand. People say, yeah, but everybody has navigation systems. We use navigation systems to find stuff we already know exist. Your wayfinding might tell us about stuff you have we didn't even know to look for. Um, and, and so you're going to see that. It will increase visitor spending. And it will keep us here longer, and it will create incentive to come back. And it will mitigate your traffic flow in and around town, and will increase the desire to live here. So wayfinding signage are signs like this. This I took in Logan, Utah. It says recreation. It says golf course, sports complex, fairgrounds, aquatic center. We didn't even know you had an aquatic center. It took us three days to find out that you had an aquatic center, and it was from some third-party site. I mean, we... So these are directional signs, and this is what you need more than anything. And I know these are state highways, but you as a city, if you, the city and the county, work with conduct Kentucky Department of Transportation, if you fund it and everything, I'm sure they'll come along. Talk to your district engineer with Department of Transportation. Do you call it KDOT? You know, and, and bring them in. But this is all wayfinding. You know, and so... It's so important in what you do. I mean, love that one, speaking of Lebanon. And so what you have to remember, once again, this is really important. It's not a substitute. Your signage will tell us about stuff we didn't even know you had. And you're going to see that. Your wayfinding system would include vehicular wayfinding, Attractions, amenities, visitor information, public restrooms if you got them, trail signage, um, and, and trail markers even, sports facilities, 24-7 uh, visitor information if you have kiosks. Uh, let's see, what else we have? Institutional wayfinding like schools, um, fairgrounds, medical, police, fire, all of those things. Even downtown. We found downtown because we just came down Business 27 and there it was. There was no sign saying downtown is this way, historic downtown, nothing. Even signs like this, the only way you would ever find this is when you're right there. There's no signs telling you how to get to this point. And by the way, we saw that sign and said, oh, there's a fairgrounds here. So what do we do? We turned, we come up to this intersection, and there's no more wayfinding. So now we're going through residential neighborhoods trying to figure out, do we turn left, do we turn right? We turned right and then left, and we did find it. But it's not, it's not complete. And so as part of this, we have this thing called destinationdevelopment.org. And on there, there are videos. There's even a video on how to do a wayfinding system. Cost, times, everything. And this will be provided for you. So we'll get you access to these. So there's a whole video on wayfinding. And in it, it talks about what's included, the 10 rules of wayfinding, how to get a wayfinding system designed and built. And so, it's going to educate both your locals and your visitors. There are many people we met that just moved here that don't even know what you have. We ran into them in restaurants and stuff. They don't know. And it delivers a better visitor experience, like I said before. It helps mitigate traffic flow, all of these things. It introduces whatever the look and feel is. Maybe you're known for wine or golf. I don't know. Most of the state's distilleries. You know, it creates a sense of place and eliminates sign clutter, you know, by organizing it. And it is an investment, not an expense. Research has been done that show that wayfinding systems will increase retail sales service by an average of 18% tax base. And then finally, if there was excellent wayfinding, you'd probably cut the divorce rate in half because us guys don't like asking for directions. <laughs> You know, signs like, this is in Appleton, Wisconsin. That was $750. It's got an aqueous coating, so graffiti and ice won't stick to it. It's mounted on existing power poles. 
So these are all wayfinding in Greenville, South Carolina. They even used pole banners for some of their wayfinding. You need it on trail signage. And by the way, you have in Kentucky allows for Todd signs. Todd is tourism oriented place. The only place that had it is, what is it, Spring Hill Farms? It says tourist activity. They're the only one that's taking advantage of a program. This is where private businesses, B&Bs and stuff, this I took in Wisconsin. Um, but yeah, oh no, it was Springhouse Gardens. They're the only ones we could find that had an allowable Todd sign telling you that they were an attraction. I was shocked that there wasn't more to that, to museums, historic sites. And they pay for it. And Kentucky has that Todd program. So what we did, we went back to TripAdvisor because we couldn't find anything. So we went back to TripAdvisor and we made a list of things to do here. Um, and then we looked at Google, things to do in Nicholasville, Kentucky. Um, and then we even went to a private website that says 15 best things, TaylorMade, Farms, Riney B Park, that's the only place we found out about Riney B Park, we didn't even know about it, um, Camp Nelson, and so this is going through a private party, a blogger who said here's 15 things to do in Nicholasville, um, or in, yeah, in Nicholasville, so we did that. And so we got that list. We started adding those together. And then we did get, from Charlotte, we got, you know, explore our, the back roads, and it gave us a list here. So we made a list of all these things. Then we found um, this one. We got, I think we got it online, and it talked about Jesmond. And by the way, all the stuff's about Jesmond. Here's what you have to understand. Visitors don't go to counties. I mean, even Napa County is Napa Valley. Sonoma County, you go by Sonoma Country. See what I mean? We don't go to counties. I mean, Brown County, Indiana, is Door County, Wisconsin, there are a few counties that have made their place. And so what happens is when you're Jesmond, we're going Jesmond, I thought we were doing Nicholasville. And so I think one thing is I'd start promoting cities, and you say locate and beautiful, I love the word Jesmond. But I, I really believe you need to promote Nicholasville, Wilmar. I think those two are fine. They're two, two totally different experiences. So we got this, and this was really about economic development. This talked about your industrial park. This talked about new developments coming here. It really talked about all of these things. And then finally, when it came to tourism, it's this one little paragraph at the end. And so we made this list. And by the way, um, everything in yellow is not even on Google or Apple Maps. So as you see this list coming up, this is what we got. So uh, Asbury Trails, we never could find. Jessamine Gorge wasn't listed. The Rock Palisades weren't listed. Enterprise Industrial Park is not listed. We never did find it. Stonedale is this new one coming. Calamar is a new one that coming. Performance Park. All of those things in yellow, they're not even on Google or Apple Maps, even if you ask for them. And so this was our list. This is what we could find. So we're having to kind of develop our, our list from everything we could get from you and what we could find online. Then this group, um, in the ones in blue, um, we had a real hard time finding. I mean, we just really, really struggled with them. So one of the things I want you to do is actually go to Google Maps and Apple Maps and actually get these places in their right locations. Um, and that they're actually listed. It's free, it only, and they're really good at responding. So it even, you, we even will provide, you remember, you're gonna have all these slides, but a lot of things weren't even listed right. I make sure Google Maps has locations correct. It's very easy to do, but somebody needs to take time. So for instance, we said, while we're here, we should figure out where we're doing this presentation this morning. So we asked both Google Maps and Apple Maps to take us to the police department. We went there and we thought, oh my God, the city defunded the entire police department? <laughs> this building is not on either of those. It takes somebody 20 minutes to go fix that. So, 
you know, and then when then we finally, we looked and we saw, oh, here it is. Here's a different, and then we went, whew. Then we found this beautiful building here. Your, your industrial park. I, we did find an industrial park. I don't know if that's an enterprise industrial park or if that's a different one. There's no signs. There's no gateways. There's nothing that says you've arrived. There's no wayfinding to it. Um, so we don't know. So you need a wayfinding system. It's one of the very top things you could do as a city. Okay? Number three. We're going through this pretty quick. Tourism. I want to talk about product development, and we want details, details, details. We want specifics. Leave no question unanswered when we're looking, coming here. You know, look at your website, you know, and, and you have one chance to close the sale. So now, does anything ever happen here at Performance Park? Ever? What's that? The homeless sleep player. But are there any concert, events, nothing takes place there? But see, so here's the thing is let us know. Invite us back. If you want us to come downtown, give me a reason to come downtown besides going to court or church or to a bank. And so that's one. Um, I mean, this was downtown, so on May 12th, you know, Taste of Jessamine, once again, I wish it was more about Nicholasville and Wilmore than it was about the county. And by the way, I'm not trying to put the county down. I'm just telling you from the people that we know. I mean, do you know every county in the state of Kentucky? I'm sure you know Fayette and maybe Mercer and some of the other counties around you, but do you know every county? Do you know every county in Tennessee or Ohio? I mean, we don't. I think you need to start changing that focus. And by the way, we did head out to Wilmore. We had to go check it out. And then we could see it's, that's a great little downtown. Um, it had more of the shops and things that you would hope that you would have in your downtown. And so it was pretty nice. I mean, even the train here, we got the little caboose there. No information. I don't know if there's no interpretive signage, but at least it looks nice. So we could see that. We did go find High Bridge. We Googled High Bridge, and we had finally found it through High Bridge Park. Um, but we kept seeing, what I kept seeing was, there's a photograph right here that sto shows a stone bridge. Where's this? Charlotte, do you know? Where is that? Oh, it's down, okay. Because I kept, we were looking for this bridge. We thought that was probably High Bridge. But we didn't know. So we did find the park. We finally found the park. It was there. And um, so we go in there. I would add interpretive signage. I mean, how high is it above the river? We can't even see it. And the trees aren't fully leafed out now. But you really can't see the river down there. We know it's down there. I think it's a cool story. Unfortunately, this sign is out by the road. It's not in the park where you could park, get out of the car. So I would actually probably move that sign that talks about the bridge. Um, you know, we've got another caboose. We're seeing trains everywhere. So we've got this here, but there's no information about it. I don't know what its significance is. There's just nothing there. Um, then we see this. I have no idea what this is. If there used to be river boats that went up and down the Kentucky River, if there still are, I don't know. There's no signage. There's no information. Then we see stuff like this. If you're looking for a great place to live and recreate, would you start crossing Nicholsville off the list? I mean, so this is very sad. You can see leaves in these things. I don't know whether, you know, they've been there for years. No brochures, no information. Um, I, this is us. We're judging you. And we don't know who's in charge or who owns this stuff or who takes care of it. It looks like nobody cares. I know it's not the case, but I'm telling you, it looks like nobody cares. You know, sometimes I can say things you'd like to say but can't without paying a political price. So I'm being really honest with you. You know, and, and I'm sure people care, but it doesn't look like it. Luckily, Charlotte said, you know, while you're here, you've got to drive down to the river. Otherwise, we wouldn't have. 
But luckily we ran into her, so we did. We drove all the way down there. Um, we saw um, the, the stuff. We saw the scale there from floods. But it, we really have rules and regulations. Nothing anywhere ever says welcome. Nothing, none, 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 nothing ever says welcome to Nicholasville. It's all, here's our rules and regulations. And so we see that, but man, how high were the floods and how often is it flooded? Um, I just think that you could add more information there. And while we were down there, we saw these really cool caves. It looks more like a shooting range. Um, but it says danger, keep out. Um, I don't know, there's that cave and it says keep out, but then there's this cave. Is it okay if we walk in this one? And how far back does it go? There's no signs, there's no information. I don't know if that's a public access, if a public um, availability to go into it. Don't know. I mean, what's it there for? There's lots of graffiti, it's very artistic. But other than that, I don't know if I can go in there, or if I should go in there, or if it's gonna be scary. But it's really cool, we found locks down there. Are those used anymore, the locks, ever? No? Does anybody know? There's no signs, no information. See all of these things. You know, if you can keep a visitor in town for two hours spending doubles. Instead, we're going there, we're seeing stuff, but there's no information. But it's a really cool site. And I don't know if the locks are ever used or not. It's a beautiful area, but nothing much to do. So from there, we said, well, let's go find these Asbury... Woods, um, Asbury Woods Trails, never could find it. We found that near the university there is a trail, but we don't know if that's the Asbury Wood Trails. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, but, but never could find those. No directional signs and no information. Then we looked for Jessamine Gorge. We couldn't find that either. We found this beautiful place when we're driving around out there in the countryside, but we don't know where that is either. There's no directions, no maps, no information. The bridge was just acting like the bridge was sitting on the right there. Which, right? No, I that. So this is it? That's the bridge you just Oh, that's the bridge that we saw in the front. Oh, okay. See, there's no place to pull over. There's no place to park. There was a lady sitting out at her house on the, on the porch who waved to us, which was very nice, um, but would have had to never known. Never known. And I don't know if this is Jessamine Gorge or if this is just the creek. Okay? Um, so, and there's no parking there anyway, but wow, that's, see, that, oh, that's cool. Um, you know, this is now we're at Camp Nelson. We decided to check that out. This is down by the highway. Are those big buildings there part of where the, the camp was? Those big buildings kind of up on the hill, or is that something totally different? Oh, that's distillery. Okay, gotcha. See, we didn't know. There's no. But that you Okay. Yeah, and, and we did go over to the cemetery, which is very moving. I thought it was beautiful, well done. Um, we did go into um, Camp Nelson, and we drove in there, and there were a few cars around. The gateway was open. Um, so we went to go in the visitor center, and we walked up to it, and it was locked. So once again, you're promoting things, but you're not letting us know that it's only open Wednesday through Saturday. You're not telling us the hours. Um, and so, so we went up there, and luckily there was a brochure there. Great, and they do have the National Park stamp. So you, if you have a National Park uh, uh, passport, you can actually stamp that you were there. Um, it would be nice if there's some pedestrian wayfinding, because there are some trails that go back there. There are interpretive signs that we could see back in there. And, um, but the brochure itself was excellent. And, and that is this brochure. So they had those there. So even though it was closed, um, I think there was a little sign on the door that says open Wednesday through Saturday or whatever. But we didn't know. We didn't know whether the quarters, the, the white building, was open and the, just the visit center's closed. We didn't know there were cars there. We just assumed they're out there walking the property. Didn't know. But they did a good job. 
So then we said, well, we did find something about Jessamine Creek Gorge rather than Jessamine Gorge, and we went there to this parking lot. It was a little bit hard to find, but we did manage to get to this parking lot, and um, is this what you're talking about? Is this the Jessamine Creek Gorge? Okay. See, see, but this is what I mean. We're not given enough information. But then the second we park, we see attention, closed, dusk to dawn, strictly enforced per KRS 511.080. Right. So I'm going to get on my phone and look up the code to make sure. I mean, it's like a little over the top. Do you really have to do the municipal code or whatever, county code, whatever it is? Um, so that's fine. We're there during the day. So we park, and then we see this sign that says you have to have an appointment to go there. It's like, ah! And we didn't know whether this whole appointment was about COVID, and it says by order of the court. We're like, holy smokes, they must have had some real bad problems here that the courthouse is shutting this place down, um, except for appointments. So we didn't know what to do. There was a couple other women that just came off the trail, and they said it was beautiful. They said there's waterfalls down there. This is all stuff we had no clue about. There's waterfalls down there. If you keep walking, it's beautiful. And I said, but we don't have an appointment. She goes, neither do we. And I went, well, do I? I don't know whether we're going to be in trouble if we go walk the trail. Um, but once again, we're not striking batting a 1,000 here in our time in Nicholasville. And so... That was a real challenge. But we did go on the website, and it's like the county website. We did see Jessamine Creek Gorge Preserve Reservations. So we clicked on the reservations, and it says it's open from 8 to 11 p.m., so that's more than dawn plus dark, so it's different already. Takes reservations for county buildings and the Gorge Preserve, um, and then has contact us, and then we did find this available start times, 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. There was, we couldn't ever get a reservation there. But then there's this building here. Where's that? Where? That's in, oh, that's one of the gazebos in High Ridge Park. Okay. See what I mean? So we thought we must be at the wrong location because if that's the gorge, Jasmine Creek Gorge is at a different park than where we were parking. Not even close to each other, really. So this is, this was, we started to get really frustrated. And then, you know, keep this up. It says that you need to, there's no maps. It says that you need to register there's nothing. There's just no information, and it doesn't look like anybody's taking care of it. And so, the, and, the, and we didn't know that there's wildlife, there's waterfalls. We don't know what kind of footwear we should have. Um, we never did walk it because we didn't have reservations. We couldn't get reservations. And we had no idea if this was even the right place because the photo doesn't match where we were at. And so, you know, how long is the trail? Can we, and by the way, the reservation for two hours, so I'm assuming you only have two hours. Yeah, she said you could go for miles down the, down the creek or the river, down the creek. And so we were totally confused. And then finally went, okay, maybe we'll have better luck at the Tom Dorman Trail. But you know what? It was the only place that actually had maps. There's none in Jessamine County. We had to go to a different county to get a map of the trails. That's not a good reflection. The reason I'm telling you this, Nicholsville, because this, even though the city doesn't control these places, I don't know who does, but it's a reflection on you as a city, as a place to live, a place to raise a family, a place to go recreate on weekends. Now the maps, that, their maps was empty too, but at least they had told you where the trails were, how long they were, all of those types of things. And so that was great. So then we said, let's go find the Jim Beam Trail. Oh my gosh, that's not even in the right location on Google or Apple Maps. Or the Jim Beam Trail, the, the Nature Preserve. 
We saw this little sign on our second visit there. The first time we totally missed it. But we didn't know whether we needed to go knock on their door to find it or whether we would knock on the other house's door to figure out where the heck this Jim Beam Nature Preserve is. Finally, we're sitting there going, this is really confusing. And we noticed down this little teeny dirt road, there's a, that little sign right there. So we drive down that road, which was barely passable for our rental car. I mean, our bumpers were like scraping on the ruts. And we get there, and it's like, not again. Not again. I mean, we have a, a kiosk with no information on it, no maps. It's embarrassing. I lifted up the thing that says, please register. It was full of spiders. I mean, I'm going, this is not good. And so that was really tough. And so, you know what? We gave up on finding any trails that we could go spend time in in Jesmond County. We gave up. What about other people that are coming to live here, to work here, to invest here? So we said, okay, well, let's start finding these wineries. You're known for wine, you know? And, and so we saw that, Sugar Creek Resort, um, First Vineyard. Um, right here, there's a for sale sign, so we don't even know if it's still in business or if it's for sale. But we drove down the road. We didn't realize it's seven miles down the road. So we drove all the way down there. And of course, I think it's only open on like Saturdays or Saturdays and Sundays or something. And so it's like, okay, we're not batting a thousand. It's a really cool site. It's beautiful. Um, of course, the vineyards, you know, the, the vines haven't, haven't leafed out yet. They're just starting. But a cool site, but there's no signs that talks about the history there. No signs that says when they're open, if any events happen there, nothing. So then we said, well, let's go find, there's another one called 1922 Winery. So we went over there, we went down the long driveway, um, beautiful little drive down there. We get down there, it's not open either. And apparently it's only open like on Saturdays and Sundays, but we don't know the times. And by the way, we couldn't even find a place that sold locally produced wines. And so this was really challenging. And we're a little, little bit, both of those were a little bit underwhelming. So we're driving around and all of a sudden we find this one. This one's not, not even in any of your marketing materials, but it was open, it was beautiful, it had beautiful grounds, it had tasting rooms, I mean, it had event venues, it had everything, and I went, why? I mean, isn't this in Jesmond County? But you know what, here's the deal. For visitors, have you ever gone anywhere and said, there's the county line, turn around quick! We don't care. If it's within a 45 minute drive of Nicholasville, include it. I wouldn't include Lexington, but if it's east, west, south of you, go ahead. That's it, we can still stay in a hotel here and go out there. Maybe it's not in the county, but it was the one thing that was open, who cares? It's closer to you than it is probably to Lexington, at least we thought so. I mean, you know, but heck, then the barrel barn that we looked online, it looked fabulous, the weddings and stuff they do there. And then we thought, okay, the historic ferry, we gotta check out the historic ferry. You know, and it's free and it's running year round, so we drive up, ferry closed. No reason why, nothing, it's just closed. And so we thought, well, let's go down there and check it out. We went down there and there was some people, there was a guy there from New Mexico. He goes, there's not even a boat here. He goes, there's nothing here. There's just the, where you park, the, there's the sled or whatever you call it, goes across the river. I mean, it just, there's no reason. It says when it'll open, if it will ever open, if there was boat problems, I, there's just no information. However, there's things like this. I saw that 1978 flood. I looked at the farmhouse across the river and I went, man, that thing must have been 20 feet underwater. I mean, there's no information even about the floods. There's just nothing. 
And once again, we have a bunch of kiosks that are empty with rules and regulations and nothing else. So then we finally said, okay, that's it. Let's head closer into town. So then we saw on a third-party site something about this, um, um, what is it, is it Riney B? Um, the, we found something about the park here, but the sign, we had driven by this like three times, and you noticed it. The sign is faded, it's worn out. Um, the banner, we caught our attention, but it shows a railroad, it shows trains there. The one on the right has something about aquatic center. There's no, you'd, no way you'd ever could read that. It looks like something from the 70s. And so, I mean, I'm, this, I'm really giving Parks and Rec a bad time here, but um, we drove in there, and I would call it something, and if it's an aquatic center, what, what do the trains have to do with it? I didn't, we didn't get it. We did go in there, we saw the little amphitheater there, and for the first time it was, yes! They actually, hopefully those are this year, but it actually gave us a reason to come back. It was the first thing we saw that said, here's what's coming up, a reason to come back. And then by the way though, the aquatic center, they're, it's all being ripped apart, you know, they're working on it. But there should be a big sign that says, here's what we're doing, major renovation underway, or we're adding whatever they're doing there. Invite us back, when will it be open? Is it Memorial Day to Labor Day? Is it, when, when is it open? What are you doing there? You can see they're investing time and money there, but once again, no invitation, no, nothing that says, please come back. And when you drive in there, you see stuff like this. I mean, I go, somebody needs to call R.J. Corman and say, can you fix this? You know, but I mean, I just, this is what you see, and I'm going, what does this have to do with an aquatic park? Why is this even here? And the same with this one right at the entrance. The paint is peeling. The first impressions are not good. I think it's a fabulous water park. We would have never found it. Had it been for some, some third-party blogger telling us about it. And we did that. The same person found out about Wing Swept Farm, which is by, of course, they do writing lessons. There. We thought that was really cool. We went out and found it. Um, we also found Taylor Made Farm. I think both those are great experiences. Of course, they're appointment only, you know, that type of thing. But, but we, we were able to find them. And then we came back into town. We said, okay, let's go back to that fairgrounds. So we did find Parks and Recreation Park close from Sunset Sunrise, which is totally fine. Um, and they have a sign up for girls volleyball. I think it's there. And it looks like decent sports facilities there. So finally, we're going to finally something that we can go see. Um, the playground right there is great. And by the way, we saw lots of little playgrounds around, but still haven't found any trails anywhere in this county. Um, other than the Creek Gorge one, which we had to have an appointment for. So we did go through the fairgrounds. We drove around out there. There's a guy out there in a pickup truck going, what are these people doing driving around the fairgrounds? We just wanted to check it out. But they looked very nice. But there, other than, and by the way, it says County Fair, July 10th, 15th. I went, yes, thank you for inviting us back. Then the other park that we had no idea exists, as a matter of fact, we found this one on like day four here, um, was Lake Mingo. I mean, we would have never in a million years found this, even though we were driving around in neighborhoods. And once again, it just, our whole thing is, here was our impression. Parks and Recreation here must be a county-wide separate entity. It's not part of the city Parks and Rec. It must be county. I don't know who they were for, but they're probably a bonded or a voted in thing, and they don't have enough money to provide what is needed for a, for a population of 50,000. They seem way underfunded and not enough recreational facilities. I mean, the signs are homemade. A lot of the signs are actually dilapidated and warped. Some of them, the signs are half missing. Um, you know, we, do, we just have 50-gallon drums for trash. It's just like, man, come on. There's a lot of money in this county, and we just just seems like the population is here, but the, the recreation isn't. You haven't kept up with your population. 
Um, there is kind of a trail here. I don't know how long it is. I don't know where it goes. A lot of it, the concrete is broken up, so it's not really ADA or stroller accessible. Uh, there's no signage. Uh, the skate park looks great. Um, and so I got to tell you, there's the bottom line. Local parks, trails, recreation facilities, and grounds seem far below in quality and quantity what you would normally have that serves a growing population like this. Way underserved. Remember, quality of life is leading economic development. And I thought, man, so does the city get into its own parks and rec and start doing some of this? Are the voters the ones who approve the county sport recreation? Don't the voters believe in how important recreation is for quality of life? So these are the questions that start coming up in our mind that are going to come up in other people's minds. Now, I will say we were going down one of your highways. We saw this trail. I have not, we tried to re-find it because I couldn't remember which highway it was on. But somewhere in this county, there's this trail. This is in the county, right? Do you, anybody, yeah? I don't know how long it is. I don't know what it's called. I don't know where it goes. Nothing. No trailheads, no signage, nothing. What, does anybody know anything about this? It's the new what? Yeah, and by the new bypass. Okay, you should market this. This is a great quality of life asset, but once again, I have no idea how long it is, where it goes. And here's the thing for Sharla. She's, her job is to promote this county, and I get it, lodging taxes and, and all that. Most of what you're promoting, I wouldn't promote because it's not ready. You know, and when you do promote it, tell us when they're open. Tell us how to find them. Give us a map. The only map we got was Charlotte. You gave us this one, right? I think she pulled this out. This isn't normally what you would give consumers. But we have Jessamine County map. And what's interesting about this, it's got all the roads and everything. Not one single attraction park or anything is on this map. It's just a bunch of roads. Nothing. So we had nothing to go by, except for Google and Apple Maps. Oops, sorry about that. Didn't mean to throw that on the floor. And so that, I, I really, you, you can't promote these in t until you're ready. Because right now, the product is not in good condition to promote. But that doesn't mean that, that um, promoting tourism, we're going to tell you what to promote here in a minute. But Charlotte said we should check out Luna's Cafe. It was one of the bright spots in the whole county. Love that little place. I wish it was downtown. Um, the Dixie Cafe, she says, if you go to King, you got to check out those little stuff. Remember, she, she said, check these out. These are things she didn't, that are not being promoted on the website, but that she told us in person. Did you know that less than 3% of visitors ever go to a visitor information center? So how would they know about those places? How would they ever find out? You know, I would, I would just say, even newly developed areas are light to no access. Trails, crosswalks, sidewalks. I mean, it should be required of developers. And yes, you have a lot of these little parks for little kids, but that's about it. You know, this one's right by downtown. And so, we did go back out and we said, we better check out these golf courses. Oh my gosh. I just thought immediately that, boy, if you, I think you've you got to be, is there any better golf destination in Kentucky than here? Pretty outstanding, the golf courses. Um, but, by the way, this one here is um, the Golf Club of the Bluegrass. Is this open for public play? It is? Okay. So when you go there, there's no signs that say open for public play. There's no signs that say whether well, there's 9 or 18 holes or 27 holes. There's no signs that say you're par. There's no signs that tell you whether they have a restaurant, a pro shop, whether you have club and cart rentals, lessons, nothing. So we assumed it was private and not open for public play. There's nothing that says otherwise. 
I mean, we thought this might even be a best of, you know, that you have a golf academy there. And so, you know, while we were in there, it went to Spring House. Now here, it said it's a tourist attraction, but it seems to be like a landscape nursery. Is, is there a tourist attraction there somewhere? What's that? Oh, they have a wedding venue. Because we drove in there and went, well, this is just a nursery. We couldn't find any. We thought maybe they had walkable gardens or something. But there was, so we're kind of like, well, that was interesting. And it looks like a nice place. At least they're taking care of, they're getting signs and getting people to go in there. Um, we did go to Keene Run. Is this open for public play? What's that? No. Yet you're promoting it as one of your golf courses to check out. I mean, it's a gated community. And so I don't know that I'd promote it um, because it's not open to the public. I mean, it is stunningly beautiful. The houses in there are absolutely incredible. We were gawking, you know, driving around. The gate was open. They were having a, uh, uh, what was it, a, a, uh, an event there, a golf event. And then Connemara, is it Connemara or Mara? Is this have public play? Okay, great. But once again, let us know. Put a sign, open for public play. I mean, is there a restaurant? Is there a pro shop? Is there anything? And so, I mean, these are all beautiful, but there's no information. Thoroughbred Golf Club, is it open for public play? Okay, so, so far we're doing good. You might be a great destination. Um, but once again, no signs telling us. No information. By the way, Google Maps has this right on the highway. We found it by going to Springhouse Gardens and there was the golf course. Because it was trying to turn us right off the highway and there's no access from the highway. It's not on the highway. So Google and Apple Maps have it in the wrong location. And then, you know, I just thought, man, you could easily be Kentucky's wine and golf destination. I mean, most of the state is so known for bourbon, you know, and, and the bourbon trail. I thought, man, this really is outstanding. It'd be a good way to promote this area, to hire in visitors, um, especially now that we know most of those are all but one are open to the public. And then number four, I have five, so there's four. Let's talk, so how do you market this? We want you to create a brochure called The Very Best of Nicholasville through your website, social media, day trips. Why should I stay in Nicholasville when I can stay in Lexington right away? I'll tell you, number one, that you should promote the hotels in Nicholasville don't charge you overnight fees to park there. That's 25 bucks a day if you stay in Lexington and some of those downtown hotels just in parking. I mean, there's lots of reasons why. But before we travel, we use the internet to decide where we're going to go. That's what we did. And then we talk to friends and family that might be from the area. And then number three is printed materials. But once we arrive, printed materials jump to number one. Even before the internet, even in 2023, we still want something we can hold in our hands, not just be on our phones. When we're in a restaurant, in a hotel room, on the road. And then number two, where's a good place to eat? The most asked question of visitors in the country is where's a good place to eat? Don't just hand us a list. And then the internet is number three, and that's going to Google reviews, TripAdvisor reviews, all of those. And by the way, printed materials before we travel, about a third of the time, once we arrive, 81%. We think you should create a brochure. It should be the very best in Nicholasville. And I'm gonna show you one you promote your anchor tenants. Anchor tenants are the things that I would drive. And we said, for Nicholasville, let's see what you have in Nicholasville that would get me to go from Lexington even, let alone Louisville or Chattanooga or somewhere else. What do you have that would pull people from Lexington even? You know, what is that? And by the way, you need to have anchor tenants. And I'm going to get more into this. Think Orlando. How many of you would go to Orlando if Disney World wasn't there? Raise your hand. Nobody raise your hand. You know they have 170 attractions. But yeah, Disney's the anchor tenant. It's the primary draw. 
So this is Alpena, Michigan. That's this brochure I'm holding right here. They did this, and we said, we want you to promote. They have 10,000, so they're a small city. And, um, and so they mailed this out to everybody. But this is what they have in their brochure. They've got all of these. Promote your anchor tenants. And I'm even going to give you the criteria. So here's that brochure. This is what they did. Each one of these people were invited to be here. And I'm going to even give you the criteria. They were invited to be in this brochure, and they each paid $400 for their page. So it didn't say who wants to buy an ad. It is promoting your best ofs. And so they went Google reviews, TripAdvisor reviews, you name it, Yelp reviews they used to do this brochure. Now, they had criteria. And this might be your criteria, but they said they, Number one is they had to be highly regarded by somebody other than themselves. Okay? So that's like Copper River Grill. Did I get the right? Copper? Yeah. Yeah. Copper River Grill. Um, you know, it was rated number one, so it must be, it must be good. Um, they, must, they need to have at least 80% positive peer reviews in regional publications written up. They need to have good curb appeal. They should be open year-round. They must be open until 7 p.m. You might not be able to do that one here because you'd have a pretty empty brochure for the most part. And then, you know, they should be open six days a week. But you might say, well, let's do four days a week, five days a week. I even went off of this. They must be unique to you, so we're not going to put in Subway and McDonald's. And we want to put in the things that are unique to you. And so we developed the list for you. Number one, I would put Performance Park there if you ever turn it into an activity center, not a place for homeless to sleep. Otherwise, I wouldn't put it in there. It could be a cool little place. It would pull people downtown. If you had big chess set, you're going to see some ideas coming up. I would put that in there. The best of would be Performance Park. I wouldn't say downtown. I'd say Performance Park in historic downtown Nicholasville. I would do Wilmore. It's a day trip. They go there. Great little shops. Great little eateries. I mean, it looks good. Um, I mean, it's a, it looks like a nice little town. It was pretty quiet when we were there in the middle of the week. But they got benches outside. So I'd have them in there. That's two. I'd have Copper River Grill in there. That's three. We couldn't find them as a chain, so I think they're probably the only one. Um, very good. The food was good. Loved it. I would do Drake's, which I do know is a chain, but it's the only one in the area. And because they're good, they're good with their entertainment, it's, it's got good food, it's a good atmosphere in there, I would include it. I would include Movie Tavern. You see where all the stuff is going. I mean, I don't know if it's good. It got kind of mixed reviews, but generally it got good reviews. I thought it was cool that you go there, movies never tasted so good. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. Jake's Cigar Bar, for sure. That place is really cool. I think it's just really cool. And the market, just across the parking lot from there. I think that's a really cool thing that, that I think you've got to promote. Even the simplified shooting range, I think, would be really a cool place and a good experience for people to do. And then get Air Trampoline Park. Now, you want to notice something. Notice I'm promoting private business. That's economic development. Think about it. Napa Valley, all those wineries, they're all private. Think about all the attractions in Orlando, 170 of them, they're all private. You're promoting trails and stuff, you're not promoting the businesses that generate revenue and tax base. You gotta promote your anchor businesses. And, and I think it's really important. I mean, Talon Winery, I don't care what county it's in, it's still a perfect, easy access from here. Um, that place, I mean, un unbelievable. Uh, Luna's Cat, I love, we love this. This was our, one of our favorite places. Love this. We would have never even known about it had Charlotte not told us that we got to go check it out. Because it's not like it's close to anything. I mean, it's, what is it, north end of town, you know, and, and uh, but it's just a great atmosphere. Um, um, and the gals in there, remember, we went there the day before, but they closed at three, which is fine, you know, because they're a breakfast and lunch place. 
And, but just a great setting, great atmosphere, good food. Hacienda, you know what? I got to tell you, we lived in Arizona for 10 years. This is better than the Mexican food we find down there, and we're right on the border. I mean, this is a really good Mexican restaurant. Um, and it's got a great atmosphere, it's just really, really good. I'd add it on this list. Downtown, we found this by accident on the very last day. We're going down and said, wait, whoa, whoa, look at this, it actually has curb appeal, something downtown with some curb appeal. As a matter of fact, yesterday, I had to put together this whole presentation, all these photographs and everything. It takes about 12 hours to do. You know what we did? We bought our meals and ate them in our hotel room, but we bought them from there. Home-cooked meals. I mean, how great is that? That is cool. Matter of fact, the lady in there said they did so well that when they opened the first two weeks, they pay off all the refrigeration and freezer units. I went, that is so cool, and it's downtown. We did go by the Dixie Cafe in Keene. It's definitely a local hangout. I'm not so sure it'd be an anchor tenant that we'd drive from Lexington to, but it's still a cool place. Boy, the line at lunch goes clear outside the door, you know, and, and, uh, but kind of a cool little place with a great story. And so I thought, if you did a brochure like this with all these places in it, you'd have people coming here from Lexington going, wow, this is pretty cool. I didn't know this was here. And granted, there's not a whole lot in downtown, but you know what? I didn't see, oh, and by the way, I did, first winery is on here, even though they're not open all those days. So there are some that I didn't show in those pictures. 1922 winery is in there. Um, but you know, the golf course is open to the public, should be in here. I think you'd be fantastic. So if you create the very best, and I, you know what? There might be one or two places we missed. We've only been here for most of a week. And there might be places you say, Roger, this needs to be on your list. It's okay. But all these places, generally speaking, had good reviews. So what do you do with this? The number one question people ask when they stay in hotels, where's a good place to eat? Please don't hand me a list. They could pull out some other kind of say, well, here's a brochure, the very best of Nicholasville. And I do Nicholasville, not Jesmond. I do Nicholasville. And then you have, here's our top restaurants, our top eateries, our top... And you cannot let politics get in the way. Well, you promoted them and you didn't promote me. Well, that's why there's criteria. And you can define that criteria. I would also have visitor information kiosks that we want you to put around the county. Um, at the chamber. And a chamber, by the way, can't do this. Can you imagine? I'm a chamber member and you're promoting them and not me. Oh, the politics would just kill it. That's why tourism needs to do it. And then... Real estate offices, I mean, these are great places for this stuff. Attractions, your trail ads. All those kiosks have nothing on them. You can have these brochures in there. So if we're out at High Bridge, we get one of these brochures and say, wow, we should go eat here when we're done. Let's go back into town. Why not? Golf courses, I mean, you name it. Then I would mail these in a number 10 envelope to, if you have a service area about 50,000, I'm guessing you probably have 20,000 households. I'm guessing. That might be everybody in the county. Because remember, the number one reason people travel visit friends and family, I would put it in a number 10 envelope with a card, and this is what the card would say. The number one reason people travel visit friends and family. We hope you'll hang on to this brochure so that when you, have, when you host company, you'll share with them the very best of what Nicholasville and beyond has to offer. After all, we believe that every dining room table should be a concierge desk. Within days, people started coming downtown, downtown um, Alpena, Michigan, in this case. They go, I got this in the mail. How long have you been here? And the merchant would go, 10 years? Because even the locals had no clue what was in their own front and backyard. This is what you should do. And then as these trails get ready, the gorge gets, the, the creek gets ready, all those things, then start adding them to this when they're ready to host visitors. You know, when you have some trail mats, when you have a place to sign in. You could even do one for historic attraction. And by the way, I'd have Camp Nelson on there too. This is one they did near Olympia, Washington, which is the state capital of Washington State. 
they took all of their historical attractions and they, and they put them in, in this brochure. And each one of these historical attractions paid like $200. And they put it, and they made it a whole tour. Um, it's really cool. I mean, would you drive an hour to see the house Bing Crosby was living in or was born in? Eh, maybe not. But gee, if it's one of 15, you know, or 11, I think there's 11 in this case, maybe you would. You'd say, well, while we're here, let's just check that one out too. But what's really cool about brochures like this are like the best of. And I'm not so sure you, you could do this one. I mean, that's where the ferry would come in and some of your historical attractions. Um, but um, I think that doing these kinds of brochures would be fantastic. I mean, there's so much history in this state or Commonwealth. And so, look at this. By doing this, they tripled their visitors by cutting their collective marketing costs by two thirds, by grouping it together. The very best Nichols, you need to do it. And um, there you go. Start promoting Nicholsville and Wilmore more than the county. We do, visitors don't go to counties. They just don't. They don't know. And then, oh, people want your best ofs, your top three. I found, Google does the top 10 things to do in Nicholsville. TripAdvisor, top 15 things to do in Nicholsville. The blog we found that had Riney B and all these other park stuff on it, that was a, some blogger. People want to know your best ofs. And by the way, if you list six restaurants or whatever I had in there, you can always say, and by the way, if you've tried all of these great restaurants for the complete list, go to our website. So everybody's being promoted. And then, once again, this distribution. Each city, town hall, chamber. I did this list, but I'm going to do it a little bit at every historical attraction, you know, at your, your kiosks, uh, the library. Um, the fairgrounds in each downtown. I mean, all of these places that people might go, you should have these. All of these places would be great. And you know, that's a real estate holder brochure that's like six bucks at Staples or Office Depot or somewhere. I mean, I could see you do a couple of these, maybe one downtown and one somewhere else, maybe one out of Brandon Chrysler somewhere. This is in... Um, uh, I can't remember, in New Jersey along the shore. I mean, it says, linger, it says, welcome friends old and new, linger here a day or two, and it's got brochures inside of it. I mean, this is in Kingsport, Tennessee. Um, they did this brochure, and each person that has their own brochure in there pays like $3 a month that keeps it clean, keeps it stocked up, um, and that's what you do. I even think you should do this um, for tourism, Get a couple of these little kiosks, so when you have sports tournaments and stuff, you can bring the visitor information to them rather than you them trying to find a visitor information somewhere. Bring it to them. And let me tell you about these. Get, I get two or three of these. They're all made with PVC. They come in like two suitcases. Um, you know, so any golf tournaments, I love the, there was the golf scramble the other day at Keen Run. Wouldn't it be great if you had one of these there talking about Nicholasville? and had your best of brochure there, and maybe, you know, the state guide. So if you're wondering what do these cost, these are made by, um, this, those were in Banff, Alberta, where I took those pictures. But there it is, Green Mountain Gazebo. By the way, we're not a sponsor. We don't get anything from it. There are other portable kiosks you can buy. Um, these things are like $1,750. You can print them up with Nicholsville logo. By the way, on, on logos and stuff, don't put historic buildings. You want to sell a lifestyle. You want to sell the countryside. You want to sell Kentucky, whether it's wineries, whether it's, you know, because you have beautiful cities and towns in this state, and almost all of them are historic buildings. And I'm just not so sure that's, that's an infrastructure, not a feeling that we want. But anyway, you can put... Gazebo, you know, um, they have a couple of calendars. This is just information. You're going to get all of this. But I think it'd be worth having a couple. They, in Banff, they bought four tourism uses, two. One they use for parts. Every once in a while, a PVC part ends up missing or broken. And so there's, 
you know, um, information on how to get these. And, and they might, there might be other manufacturers out there, who knows. I'd have them at the county fair for sure. I'd have probably two or three locations during the county fair. Um, once again, your sporting tournaments, uh, you know, baseball, soccer, you name it, any festivals and events, the taste of, the taste of Jessamine, which I would call the taste of Nicholasville in the future. Popular recreation sites. Um, I mean, if you do trade shows, uh, if the hotels are doing any kind of retreats, things like this. And in this guide, I would actually have like two or three panels that have a map that just show where the river is and shows where these attractions are. Because we logged hundreds of miles finding stuff. We'd drive to one place, and then we'd go to the next place and be 14 miles away. And then we go to the next place and we're back with that one because we didn't know. We don't know the names of the streets, all the highways, all the addresses. So we we're driving all over the place. And so include a map. And then city. I'd redesign your website. Cities need to run like businesses. Tax base. The way to improve the quality of life for your citizens is through tax base. And so your website needs to help sell the city. I mean, you're, the city is economic development. I think your website looks, and no offense, there's a ton of municipal websites out there that are they, they look too much government. And it doesn't really sell you. It's all text, no photos, nothing. We were, last year, we were assessing near Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, a little town called Waupon. The only reason I remember how to pronounce it is because it's like, please pass the Grey Poupon. You know, that's how I remembered it. But this is their city website. Look at that. This is, what's it doing? There it is. So naturally adventurous, welcome to Wapan. And by the way, look it up there. Residence, business, visitors. Bingo. And right on that homepage, you can see there's a video right there. And then if I scroll down, it says, I want to connect with, I want to report, I want to find it. They made this user friendly. Here's that video, it's only one minute long. Let's see if the sound will go through. I forgot to check this to see. Oh, it didn't go through. I guess I didn't turn up the, I didn't. Yeah, this didn't. Exploring our neighboring community. Today we're in Wapan. Did you know Wapan is known as the city of sculpture? Let's go check more out. Did you know that Wapan is just a couple miles away from one of the major entry points to Oracle Marsh, often referred to as the Everglades of the North? Did you know that Wapan is an awesome baseball complex hosting regional tournaments of all levels? Did you know that Wapan on the beautiful Rock River is home to the iconic end of the trail of sculpture? This is on the homepage of the city's website. See what I mean? You're, you, this is how you get tax base. This is how you get economic development. And finally, my last big chapter, downtown. I want to talk about it. Critical mass, blade signs, after work weekends, your community living room, what comes first? First of all, what's the future downtown? You need to talk to your property owners. You as a city don't control what's in buildings unless you want to rezone everything downtown. Because right now, I kept going, what are we going to do at downtown? What am I going to tell them about downtown? It's full of churches, banks, the courthouse, and law firms. Virtually every other business in there is gone. We saw where there were coffee shops. We saw where there was restaurants. They're all gone. I don't know, Brandon Cross and Gill. I mean, you still have your breakfast. You still have your lunch crowd working downtown. Um, but there was just no activity, no life. Um, and, and if you want downtown to be a future, 
you've got to start talking to property owners. And let me tell you how to do this. So if you want to be more than an eight to five, we roll up the sidewalks at five, then I'm going to give you what you need to do to get there. And, you know, right now you have a bunch of facade improvements and stuff for downtown. It means nothing. Forget the facade improvements. You don't even have businesses to improve. Facade improvements, it's what's in the buildings that makes you a draw. Downtown already looks very nice, but there's, there's nothing there to get me there after work. If I'm not going to church, a bank, or the courthouse, or to visit my attorney, why would I ever go downtown in Nicholasville? So you have to start with your property owners. Matter of fact, I gotta tell you, we did a survey of 2,000 downtowns in the US and Canada, and out of those 2,000, we found 400 of the most successful, including many in Kentucky, and we did the 20 ingredients. I'm going to give you the 12 most important ingredients. So I'm not going to do all 20 of these. But number one is you need the rule of critical mass. In your downtown, we have the 10, 10, 10 rule. And you do have your three linear blocks. We could go back a block even. Here's what is in that 10, 10, 10. 10 places that sell food. Right now, I think you have one, and that's, that's the, the place where we bought our meals. I, if there's another one, I don't know where it is. All you need 10 places that sell food. You know what? If downtown had 20 restaurants, you'd have people coming from Lexington to go to downtown. You need 10 places to sell food. Doesn't have to always be sit-down restaurants. It can be little cafes, all of those types of things. Then you need 10 destination retail shops. That could be galleries, it could be a bookstore, it could be a wine store, it could be collectibles, home accents. If you want downtown to be a draw, think about all these places, whether it's Berea, Paducah, Harrodsburg, I mean, I'm trying to think of, you know, um, Bowling Green, you name it. And out of those 20, you need at least half of them open after six o'clock. So you got to talk to your property owners. And I'm going to give you some ideas here. The reason this is really important is they also need to have consistent hours and days as merchants, as restaurants. And they need to be open into the evening hours. And you need to have like business group together. The reason Brandon Crossing works, even though it has no personality, it's not about people, it's about cars, there's at least a dozen restaurants up there and another dozen things to do. But the problem is, even like Crumble Cookies, it's a chain. It's, it's, it's not Nicholasville. It's a chain. It's modern. It's, but it, that's where you're going to go now because that's where they are. Man, I'd be going to Luna's, I'd be going anywhere I could and say, what would it take to get you in our downtown? And I'm going to tell you what, how to get them downtown. And then you need to have an anchor tenant. You need to have one business that says, let's go downtown because that restaurant is so good. Right now your anchor tenant is the courthouse. And then a central gathering place. I mean, think about antique malls. Every little booth in an antique mall is a private business. They all compete with each other. But you know what? They do 10 times the business when they're all together. Auto malls. If you ever go anywhere where there's auto malls, they do seven times the sales when they're grouped with their competitors. Um, corner gas stations. Remember those days? You know, fast food restaurants. I mean, you name it. They're all right next to each other. Food courts and malls. Critical mass. So sometimes you have to orchestrate the effort. You have to start with your property owners, not tenants. We want to make, and if you said we want to make downtown our community living room, we want it to bring it, we want it to be more than law firms and courthouse. What can we do to get you downtown? And then let me tell you what you have to do to make them want to come downtown. And so this is all that. It only takes one third to buy in. And I'll get into all that. So many are now result of your street level, re, they're actually restricting the use of street level businesses. Doing zoning overlays that say on street level has to be restaurant or retail. 
things that would be open into the evening hours. And I'm not saying you have to do that, but that is a new reality. And then I kept going, wow, can you imagine if that right there was a little coffee shop or a bistro or a sandwich shop? And outside there on the corner was all these tables and chairs with umbrellas. Now, I'm not trying to kick the insurance company out of their place. We like having them in town. We like having them downtown. But you go, can you imagine if they had tables and chairs out there, a little picket fence, maybe some planters with trees in them, and inside was food? You know, I mean, wouldn't that be cool? You know, I kept going, would that just, oh, it just fits, and it's right on a corner. I mean, even places like this, we've seen these turn into microbrews where they open up the garage doors and they've spills out in the summer months. You've got tables and chairs. Now, once again, I'm not trying to kick these people out of their business, but if there was that mentality with the property owners downtown, here's what you say. If you will move downtown and do what I'm suggesting, we will bring customers to your front door. And I'm going to show you how to do that. But I kept going, this downtown is made for this. But you know what's coming into downtown? Downtowns are about Etsy, not big box. I mean, the last, the one zoning overlay I put downtown is no chains or franchises. That's the one zoning overlay I put downtown. Because can you imagine if you had Dairy Queen in downtown? I mean, that's not Nicholasville. And no offense to Dairy Queen. But you know what would work in your down? This, believe it or not, I'm telling you the truth. This is what you'll find in downtowns everywhere. The butcher, you know where I'm going. The baker, and yes, the candlestick maker. These are the kinds of businesses that are coming back into downtown. Those little donut shops, those little bakeries, the little, the little um, um, butcher shop, all of those things. And by the way, downtowns are about where we go after working on weekends. And your downtown, closed. So we go to Lexington, you know, or Banyan Crossing. And by the way, look at this. 70% of all consumer retail spending takes place after 6 p.m. No wonder they head north. 70%. That's the National Retail Federation, by the way. You know, you need to have at least one anchor tenant downtown. I think it's absolutely critical. I, I showed Luna's because we just love that place. And number five, people moving into downtowns, they're boomers. They're not young people. Young people, just like every other generation, we want to move out in the suburbs where kids can ride bikes. You know, have a yard to play in. Boomers are moving downtown, so upper levels should be lodging or, or could be homes. I mean, this is coming to you in a few years, if <laughs> it's not already here. And then number six of this, 70% of first-time sales comes from curb appeal. That's in Nino, Wisconsin. That's before. Sorry, it's in the shadow. Before, after. Their retail sales went up 30-some percent. Just by going from that, it's better on that picture over there, to that. I mean, look at the difference. Sales went up 30 some percent. Downtown has no curb. Of course, right now there's no real retail to pull people into doors. This was a little coffee shop up in St. Albert, Alberta. That is before, look at the after. His sales went up 400%. Just by doing that. So there's the power curb appeal. I mean, just, you know, go to, you know, there it is. I mean, that's just outstanding. And by the way, women account for 80% of all consumer retail spending. I'm waiting. Usually there's a guy in the audience that pipes up and says, that's all? But it's actually true, and they want places that are, they feel safe, there's people there, and you're downtown after five o'clock, it's, it's empty. Even during the week, other than because it's a state highway, you get traffic nightmare, but that's it. There's no real personality. 
But when we talk about curb appeal and feeling safe, I can't believe how many planters were full of dead stuff. I mean, that's, that was an evergreen, so I don't think that's coming back this spring. Even these chairs there have holes in them. You know? I mean, I would be adding pots and plants down there once you recruit your business mix. If you want retailers and restaurants, curb appeal is everything. You know, I mean, look at this picture. What do you see? You see the guys sitting in benches while their wives are in shopping. You know, and so I always say, think benches. I mean, you out of benches downtown. You have a few. But you know, I always wonder, why do we do this on our front porches? Because it makes our homes feel welcoming. Same with downtowns. So those facades, it's not about the facade, it's about what you put on the sidewalk to break up the transition between sidewalk and facade. Benches, pots, planters, extensions of window displays to exterior spaces once you have the business mix. And then, <clears throat> number eight, what is that word I put there? Retailers and restaurants. Oh, need blade signs. Can you tell me what's in any of those shops? If we're driving down the street or walking down the sidewalk, this is what we see, blade signs, perpendicular to us. If you don't allow them as a city, change your ordinances. They have them in Wilmore, but they don't have them in Nicholasville. And of course, right now, you really don't have the retail to put signs out there. These are blade signs. They're consistent height, consistent side. And by the way, you look, it says chocolate, collectibles, trains, restaurant. They always sell what it is to pull people in the door. That was in Leavenworth, Washington, cute little Bavarian town. This is in Nantucket, consistent size. That's also in, uh, oh, this one here is in Carmel, California. And so these are blade signs. Can you tell me what's in there? And by the way, the awning's about ready to fall down on the far side. You know? Do you allow blade signs? Shouldn't be. All you can do is say, we'll, give you a, we'll, give, we'll allow you to do blade signs. You should even offer that as part of a facade program. And then just say, we want to make sure, because here's the, here's the deal. We're afraid of legalities. So if a sign fell on the public sidewalk, we, the city, could be held liable. What do we do? We kill our downtown because we regulate it too much. And so you can say, make sure your sign is included in your insurance. Um, but you should have it. And it shouldn't be a condition. You should incentivize it. I mean, can you tell me what's in any of these shops? And by the way, they were painting this one on the left like yesterday and the day before. It looks really great. Don't have any idea what's going to go in there, but it looks great. How about here? There's no incentive once we're on Main Street to keep walking downtown. There's no signs. There's no anything. The only way you know what's in downtown is to be across the street. Good luck getting over there. I mean, you've seen that. You know the traffic downtown. And then, by the way, if you recruit the right kind of business, two-hour parking will kill it. You know what the rationale is? And a grant with a courthouse, I get it. You know, but two-hour parking the, in a pedestrian-friendly downtown, think of the, the, the tourism-oriented downtowns you have, four hours. So if we're going to go hang out at, at the park, at Performance Park, and then we're going to go eat dinner, this is if you have that business mix, you need to extend your hours, your parking hours, four hours. That's how much time people will spend in a pedestrian-friendly downtown. Now, you want those businesses to come downtown, then you need 250 days worth of activity downtown. Don't freak out yet. We're not talking about 250 days of events. But you can do a farmer's market once a week. I'd put it right in the middle of downtown. But you might do that for 12 or 14 weeks. Well, you still got another 235 days to go. You need activity. This is Rapid City, South Dakota. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Downtown should be your community living room. Think about activities you would do at home, whether it's table games, whether it's a backyard barbecue, whether it is anything. Think about it. I mean, this is what they've done. This was in a couple of parking spaces. 
in one of the downtowns we're looking at. They just took a couple parking spaces. And I'm not saying you would do that, because I think you've got places where you don't have to take up parking. But it's about bringing music downtown, unamplified music. You know, that's in the, the Kootenay Rocky Mountains in British Columbia. This is in Asheville, North Carolina. I mean, think about places where you could do this during the winter months where people just come and hang out. Think about having a place where when you do the Taste of Nicholasville or Jesmond, you have all this, and you could do this with big screen movies. You could do this with chili cook-offs, events, just activities, a place to go hang out. I mean, imagine fine places like this. These are like 700 bucks for the, for the big, huge chess sets and the, and the vinyl board that they're on. You know, I'd create, I'd create a team of volunteers called Destination Downtown Nicholasville. I call it Destination, not because of just tourism, Destination for local residents, for business investment, and for, for, and for people to come and hang out. So I'd create that team. This is Rapid City, South Dakota. This is a public parking lot, has 60 spaces. I said, I want you to get rid of that parking lot and see that big building in the background? That was the Sears building, it was abandoned. It was people, what was living in it was pigeons and raccoons. And I said, I want you to tear down that building and take this 60 space parking lot, don't make up the parking, I want you to turn it into a plaza. I get a call from a guy who says, Roger, my name is Ray Hillebrand. I own a lot of property downtown, and we're not taking down that building. I just bought it. But I also gave the city a couple million dollars to build a plaza next to my new building. Smart. He has the highest per square foot rents of anybody in Rapid City. So this is it before. There it is, before. Across the street before, that is a parking garage in the back. However, on the lower level, there's now public restrooms, visitor information, they actually park a Zamboni in there. So it's not like they made it up. But you can see there's two levels. There is a third level, but that's just to make up for what they lost on the first level. So people do have to park two or three blocks away. So this is before, that's after. It has to be activities 250 days a year. It doesn't have to be events. Just activities. That splash pad runs for 120 days a year. It works. And guess what? In the winter, that whole thing, that's, there's the whole, I think maybe I have even more pictures of it. But I kept thinking, this space here is just a dead space. Put activities in there. Something in there. Give us a place to come hang out. Put a food truck in there. Food trucks would be a great way to jumpstart downtown. I mean, you could just bring these places to life. You know, this here, I mean, it's just, there's nothing there. It's, it looks pretty, it's kind of cool, but why would I go spend time there? So here's Rapid City. That's it in the summer. There's that splash pad. Runs 120 days a year. In the winter, Another 120 days a year. That's 240 days of activity downtown. By the way, they make $150,000 a year just renting ice skates. They set it up every winter. It's not built in. They have to set it up. They ice it. We've even seen synthetic ice rinks work. But you know what happened in Rapid City? The average age of a, buy a, a person buying a home in Rapid City dropped 12 years once this opened. Young people are coming back. I mean, and then at 9 o'clock at night, it goes to music and higher pressure water and stuff. Um, and just puts on this little show. I love this. They do movies on the park on every Monday night during the summer season. Somebody wrote in social media, I grew up in Rapid City, it was never as cool as it is now. If you create 250 days a year of activity downtown, you'll have no empty retail spaces because you'll be bringing customers to their door 250 days a year. They can't survive on you bringing people downtown 30 days a year. And these would be activities, not events. And look at that. That's astounding. 
So, when I first did this in, in Rapid City, I went to 25 businesses. I said, make me a list of the businesses who fought losing parking to put in this plaza. Because we surveyed 100 plazas in the United States that are programmed, that are actually programmed, which means there's activities. And I said, I want the ones, the 25 that fought the most about this happening. And I went into all 25. In 14 of them, I talked to the owner. But all 25 of them said, it's the best thing Rapid City has ever done. And they fought it. Even when I went there for the grand opening, I was half an hour late, late meeting the mayor, the city manager, the tourism director. Um, I was there with Jane. We were half an hour late. I said, man, we had to, there were so many damn pedestrians downtown and so many people. We had to park like 20 minutes away. And they said, you're so, we're so glad you're, li you're late because that's exactly the problem they want to have. It's worth the walk. And then... There's zero retail vacancies. Before, 30%. Lower turnover. They're not leaving. They're open later in the business because the key hours for a plaza is 4 to 9 o'clock at night. And we're not talking about amplified music because you do have neighborhoods around downtown. We walked all of downtown, including back two and three blocks. And many of the businesses continue to break sales records. I mean, we can just keep going down the list here. You know, it's now a great place for conferences, conventions, you name it. But you know, I would contact somebody and say, okay, how do we bring this to life? Let's do a plan. Who's going to watch it? Who's going to maintain it? You know, who's, where's security going to be? Who's going to keep the foosballs from getting lost when we put them out there? You know, pick up the chess sets. You know, you can buy all of these things. There they are, 25 inches tall. Here's where you can buy all these chess sets. Here's Jenga blocks. They're like $79. They're like four feet high. I mean, think about it. It's a community living room. This is in downtown New York City, Bryant Park. Bryant Park they built for the locals because all the tourists were at Times Square. This is where the tourists go now. They have ping pong tables, foosball tables in Bryant Park in New York City. They've never had vandalism problems. Can you imagine having a small stage out there where you have locals provide Jenga classes or, or um, you know, yoga, anything, Tai Chi? Can you imagine if you did this? Okay, we got some places. You can even get sponsors. And one sponsor might buy six of these ECR for kids, these, these little six like tic-tac-toe. I mean, these are, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can even ask sponsors. You put out a sandwich board. This is sponsored by, uh, you know, uh, Corman, you know, or this is sponsored by a law firm, or this is sponsored by the city, the county, somebody. I mean, all these can be sponsored by people. Can you imagine having these things? So you need a place to store them, and then every couple of weeks you change them around, depending on weather. I mean, can you imagine having hula hoops? You can get 40 quantity hula hoops. Look at that whole thing would be less than $1,000. These are all of, I love these spun chairs. They spin around. You know, I mean, these are all things you could do that wouldn't be a high cost. But this is when I taught, when the first person we met said he had to move to Lexington, we started talking about this kind of stuff. He said, if we had this kind of stuff around here, I would have stayed. You know, I mean, these are just the cool things you do. These are musical instruments. You can even have little booths that you sell to local people to sell jewelry and everything. Make your downtown like a small incubator, business incubator. I mean, think about it. You can even do a portable skate park. I know you got one, but cornhole tosses. I mean, you name it, little fire pits, badminton kits. I, you know, there's, there's, we were in towns in British, in Alberta, where they actually wear snow gear in the winter and they're out there using exercise equipment in the middle of downtown. Free fitness. I just think all of these things could be done inexpensively. Yes, you have to have to place to store it. Yes, you have to, I love this imagination playground. They're like Lincoln logs, you know, made out of foam. For kids, you could do that at spring break. So all that stuff I showed you, everything. If we added all that up, look at all that stuff. The list keeps growing here. Let me keep growing the list here. Let me keep growing the list here. If you went and bought all of that stuff, 
Everything there was $76,000. There are even ARPA funds out there, recovery grants out there to buy this kind of stuff. I sponsor sandwich boards or plaques, you know, so if some of the stuff is sponsored. Can you imagine having these kinds of things in your downtown? Now, right now, putting those things downtown, still no place to spend money. At you're, least you're creating a living room, and if you bring in food trucks, we're creating tax base. But you know what? Just having these things, and then people, restaurants, they're saying, well, if this is where the people are hanging out, that's where we're going to go. You know, when houses moved to the suburbs, retail went with them, malls, suburban malls. That's exactly what happened. It's a way to bring them back. This is a downtown Seattle. Just a place for people to come and hang out. There's foosball tables, ping pong tables, food trucks, you name it. I mean, this is Caldwell, Idaho, Destination Caldwell, Destination Rapid City. It's a group of, and I would get millennials to help lead this. But you know, I looked at this and I went, oh my gosh, there it is. Can you imagine if all of those, all those little businesses there, and I'm, this is just imagine, one was an ice cream shop, one was a little coffee shop, one might be a little panini stand. These are all small little businesses. Yeah, I'm sure this parking lot belongs to the bank or is private, but I kept thinking, what if? What if then, what if there was little restaurants, eateries? What if the bank was still there, but it took part of that first floor and put in a restaurant, a coffee shop, something that had outdoor dining? What if? What if you got rid of all 23 parking spaces there, counted them, and said, we want to put in paver stones and make this a plaza? Now, I'm not trying to displace any business in downtown, but maybe those property owners would catch the vision and say, we see where you're going with this. You're a service area for 50,000 people with no real downtown. You gotta create it somewhere, otherwise you're just gonna keep growing your strip malls. I mean, we saw the other ones, the Stone Gate that's gonna have 175,000 square feet, you're just creating more, more big box and you have no central gathering place. But I kept going, what if you did that? There's parking back there. I don't know if it's public, I don't know if it's private, I don't know. But people will walk blocks to come to a place where they can come hang out. So whether you use Performance Park, whether you use that one, and by the way, we don't want, we're not trying to kick people out. But you know what? We did this in Jackson, Wyoming. Jackson Hole, town of 10,000. And there was an insurance agent. I said, around here, they have a little square. People call it um, Antler Park, because it's got antler entryways into this little square. And I said, we want to remake the business mix. And the insurance agent goes, why would I move my business? Well, to make a long story short, we recruited into that town 85 galleries and Western living shops. That insurance agent said, I could make twice as much money leasing this out to a restaurant. I'm going to move three blocks away. I don't have to be downtown. And even attorneys and everything. I mean, you have what I call the Texas conundrum. You have a courthouse and surrounded by law firms. And I get it, I get it, they're right next to the courthouse, I get it, but they close at five. In Conroe, Texas, we even took the front of law firms and put in little like ice cream shop in the first 15 feet just to activate the street front. But anyway, I just kept going, man, there's so much potential. Number 11, remember this, if you don't hang out in your downtown, neither will visitors, and you're not hanging out in your downtown. We've been down here every evening, even during the day. So, that is really, really critical. And then number 12, remember that women account for the spending. They want to be in places where it's active, where there's people there. They love the Etsy-style shops. And so, that's all I got for you. I mean... You have a really great city. And you have amazing people here. Every single person we talked to was friendly, and nobody that we ran into would say, so how do you like Nicholsville? Nobody ever talked it down. We love that. And I've always said that we've, we've been in all 50 states, <laughs> and the four commonwealths, 
oh, including the floor. And everywhere we've been, I've always said that outside of mountains and coastlines, this is the prettiest state in the country. Yeah, you can go down North Carolina and Tennessee, but you're in the mountains or you're over on the coast. But I think you have such a beautiful city. Here, you know one of the, my favorite things about Nicholsville is you could be right here or right in the middle of downtown, drive three minutes any direction and be out in the country. Do that in Lexington. I mean, it's a fantastic way of life here. I think your wineries, it's fantastic that there are wineries. I don't know how many wineries there are across the state, but the fact that you have a few, and yeah, if you got them in neighboring towns, I don't care. We also saw Chrisman Mill or whatever. That one apparently went out of business, right? Closed. And so, but there might be other ones. Who cares? As long as they're within a 45-minute drive of you, who cares? Own it. That and your golf courses. And I, I just think that what you have here is absolutely fantastic. But I really believe that in downtown, you've got to start with your property owners. Maybe you get them together. Maybe you go knock on their doors, meet them one-to-one. -one. A lot of them might be absentee owners. You've got to go to them and say, we have an idea for downtown. If we help you recruit the right business into your space, we will do what we can to bring customers to their front door. You know, in Rapid City, the, the space, the rents around that plaza within three blocks doubled. Property owners were making twice as much money because the city was doing what it could to bring people to their front door. And by the way, you might create a business improvement district downtown where the property owners help fund that, you know, the operation of it. And with Destination Rapid City, all these plazas, they're in Topeka, Kansas. They're in small towns like Deadwood, populate Deadwood, South Dakota. They just did a plaza. And, and they're usually operated by a business improvement district. They do beer gardens. They do, and, so you, and they're usually self-funding, largely self-funding. Because they, they get revenues from vendors. They get revenues from sponsors. They get revenues from ice skate rentals. If you have a portable ice rink, you put in in the winter for a couple months. You know, and so you can do that type of thing. And, and I think it would be fantastic. The potential is there, but you don't control who owns the properties. But somebody's got to go sell them. I think you can do it. I think it would be awesome. Otherwise, you need to go find a place you can create. You know, whether it's back a block or two, I don't know where it would even be. But, you know, doing, and, and the other thing. So other than downtown, is somebody somewhere around here, you need it. Your recreational assets have not kept up with your population growth at all. Not even close. And that's compared to other cities we've worked in in Kentucky. So I'm not comparing you to Lexington. But, but per capita, you don't have near the recreational facilities. And I don't know how you address that with Parks and Rec. It's a different entity than you. Or whether you say, we're going to create our own in addition. Um, I don't know. I, those, are, those are questions I can't really answer for you. But those are our first impressions. That was the two things. was downtown, and you need more recreational assets besides the little playgrounds. Make sense? Okay, does anybody have any questions? Or Mayor, I should probably leave this up to you since we are in a formal setting. Yeah, well, we appreciate you coming. I think this was a very beneficial assessment of our city. Uh, we appreciate you coming and giving us your Yeah, we're, we're seeing it. Right. No, no, we never talked at all. We never, the mayor, I never had a direct conversation with the mayor at all. I mean, Darren and I had a couple, of, but it was really about logistics. I even asked them, I said, do you even have an area you want to focus on? And they said, no, just do your general, you know, we wanted to be about downtown, but look at the whole area. They didn't give us anything. And, and I mean, we found out where to stay. We did, we did everything. And, um, and it is fabulous. What you have here, the, the pros outweigh the cons by far. Remember, the whole focus is what could we do to make it better? This is not about you did something wrong, but if you did a wayfinding system 
If you worked on downtown, what you have to do with your property owners, if the property owners are saying, we're going to leave it the like it is, I'd rather have it empty than bring in a restaurant or something. I mean, you can't really control that, you know. I mean, you do have a building downtown that's condemned. I thought, man, maybe you should take that, take it out, and both buildings could put a little plaza where that building is and then have them open up onto that open plaza. Can you imagine a performance park there? If, so if the bank says, no, we need that parking, or well, I don't even know who owns that parking lot, but even this space right here in this picture, I mean, you have places you can activate now if you can bring the retailers downtown so while we're there, we have places we can spend money and time. Be fabulous. You already have a narrow street. It's, it's you know, pretty pedestrian friendly. Your sidewalks are kind of narrow. You can't really do sidewalk cafe dining because the sidewalks are narrow. You already are pushing it on ADA access, um, but it makes an intimate setting. No, I mean, nobody's blazing through downtown at 40 miles an hour, at least not that we saw, you know, and, and so you already have a nice, nice setting. Um, we did see the little the only, like, what is it, the gathering place? It's da back a block. I think it's a little water watering hole or whatever. The public well. That was the only thing we saw downtown that was like, you know, that kind of fit into what we're trying to do downtown. Um, um, and it's where they go. Yeah, it had outdoor cafe dining. So anyway, I, the potential is here. Um, I don't think any of this is rocket science. I probably didn't tell you anything you didn't already know. You just had to see it through different eyes. You know, and sometimes that's beneficial. So with this, this is being recorded. We are going to do an assessment findings and suggestions report, which will encapsulate this in printed form. We'll get that to you in the next 30 days. So you'll actually have this documented. You have this on video. It's being recorded. It could be put on YouTube, and you could do chapters. Chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Here's the five things if you want to see about downtown. So somebody doesn't have to watch the whole two hours. You know, there are two hours and 15 minutes. They can watch it in pieces. So you have this there. Um, um, I, I think what you have is incredible. Um, I, I love the fact that people want to be here. You know, they're moving here. They love it. You live in the outskirts. They're not that far from Lexington, but they're out in the country. Um, I think this is a great way to really, really jumpstart um, the next Nicholasville. And I think Nicholasville is a big enough city now that it needs to stand alone. It doesn't need to have the county's name in front of everything. I mean, you're, you're one of, what are you that, you know, that, what I read, seventh fastest growing city in the state, and, you know, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty darn good. So, yes. Uh, Roger, you mentioned that... Sorry, sorry, I should have left that to the mayor to call, but... Yeah, that's fine. Go okay, good. Yes. 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 It, it, I think it's your brand direction. Paducah, what do you know it for? Art, folk art. Berea, I mean, what about um, Bowling Green, Corvettes? I mean, I, we could go down the list. Lexington, horses. Um, I, I mean, we could keep going down the list of all well, Louisville, you know, is it the Kentucky Derby? Is it uh, Louisville Slugger? You know, I mean, almost, I mean, you have well-branded towns, whether it's the birthplace of Lincoln or Daniel Boone or, I mean, this, taste, this state is full of well-branded towns. And yes, for you, I think wine and, wine and uh, the golf courses are great. And you know what? That brings in the highest-end visitors. That's the, if you want tourism, you got hotels. You know, this Hampton Inn is pretty nice. As a matter of fact, the first day they opened, there was a major concert in Lexington. They said they had people staying there from Chattanooga and everywhere. I mean, they're, they're here. People are here, and they want things to do. And yeah, I think it puts you on the map. I think horses are always going to be part of your legacy. I mean, you're, you're next to the world capital horses in Lexington. The, the horse park and everything, I think those are great, but, and you have Taylor Run and Wingspet Farm, you have those, a question, that, it's kind of a given, but what differentiates you, I think, are the wineries, particularly if they up their game a little bit, and add in a couple more, who cares what county they are in, if they're within a 45 minute drive, you're the, you're the hub, 
But I think the golf, I mean, I, I can't imagine, I've been all over this state and I, or Commonwealth, I haven't seen any place that, ha these golf courses seem to be outstanding. Now we didn't go play them, but, the, but just, the, I mean, they're beautiful, it's just stunning. Sure. I'll let you repeat that. So, uh, yeah, I was asking, we, we talked a moment ago that may not have been picked up uh, about how Roger mentioned that uh, maybe calling our, you know, Nicholasville, Kentucky's wine and golf destination might be helpful for branding. And uh, he mentioned some, some difficulties. Uh, and I was wondering if there are things that we, the city, can do to help uh, help promote those uh, yeah. and, and help them to fix some of the, the issues that where they're not maybe getting the exposure that they need. Yes, and I think it's a really good question, but I think it's a fantastic brand direction. Who else in this state could own those? Who else? I couldn't find any other wine destinations. I mean, of course, you know, everybody knows the whole state for bourbon. Um, and the Bourbon Trail is one of the best attractions in the U.S. Um, but I think the wine, I think it goes great with golf. Um, and then, then you start bringing in artisans, you know what I mean? The, this is all the higher end visitors that you could attract here. And you have a lot of money living in this county, but they're not spending any money that I've seen. They're not here on Main Street in Dollar General, no offense. They're looking for things that they, I think they have friends and visitors visiting them, but they really don't, you don't have any assets that fit them. So I think the wineries, I think the wineries, they could do a little better on their curb appeal. Maybe they're, if you start promoting them front and center as you're kind of your main attraction, maybe they'll be open a few more hours. Even from like, and I, by the way, I would do it from like the beginning of April through the end of October. No more Memorial Day to Labor Day. That ended like 30 years ago. You know, but during that, that period, that spring, I mean, this place is beautiful. Even right now, all the trees are leafy. It's stunning. It's fall color. I'd go through that season and say, could we open three days a week, you know, during the season? And, and let us know when you're open, what you can do. I think doing the taste of, of Jesmond, the taste of Jesmond, but taste of Nicholasville would certainly play into that. There's your wine pairings, all of those things. Um, any farm-to-table dining you might have would be a great fit into that. But the whole wine and golf fits into food. It fits into, you know, any of the culinary arts. It fits into performing arts. It fits into visual arts. It fits into your community living room idea. It all fits together. And even bringing in little food trucks. And we worked in one town where there was this little food truck that, that did barbecued uh, pork and beef. And uh, they did so well that they, out of the food truck, that they were selling 1,500 pounds of chicken, pork, and beef a day out of the food truck. So they moved into an inline business in downtown. Now they're starting to franchise. So downtown could be a great little business incubator for people that do jewelry or painters. I'll bet you there's a lot of artisans in this town that we have no clue even exist. They're here. Give them a, give them a place. And that will bring some of this money and stuff into your downtown and into your shops once you start recruiting them in. Do we need to work on improving the, the wine and golf situation with some of these de <coughs> deficiencies you mentioned first? Or do the branding first? Or does the sequence there really matter? What I would do with branding, a couple things about branding. By the way, branding is not about logos and slogans. Have you ever gone anywhere because they had a great logo? Have you ever said, I'm not going there because I think their logo sucks? No, we don't. I mean, I said, you know, historic buildings, look at where you're at. I mean, you know, this state was, you know, the Commonwealth founded in the 1700s. I mean, my gosh, you have history everywhere. Um, I think that branding is about the experience. So you could say, you could tell people, we are working on becoming Kentucky's wine and golf destination. You already own the golf destination. And you might, I might add, there might be one or two other ones. I don't know, you got, you got several of them that have golf academies and golf lessons and stuff. I think it's fantastic. It's a sport that's desperately trying to maintain its status. Um, and, and so I think doing the golf there, I think doing the wineries, I mean, Talon's ready to go. And there might be a couple other ones. Uh, the, the two that I went in, if they were open a few more hours, I think having the first vineyard, commercial vineyard in the country, that's pretty cool. 
you know, I just wish it was more open, or when we went there, we could walk around, maybe there's some trails or something. If so if you're not open, at least we can see the history of the buildings and stuff there. Um, and, and so I think you say, we want to work on doing this. This is what we need. Because once you put it out there, if we come here like us and nothing's open, then you say, yeah, well, they say they're this, but like the golf courses, they don't even say they're open for public play. They don't even say how many holes they have or if you call for tee times and, I mean, how far in advance. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the golf course is. But, yeah, if they start doing the product, it's like the trails. I said, don't market these because they're not ready. Same with that. So I'd say in 2024, we want to be known as Kentucky's wine and golf destination. In 2023 is our getting ready year. Put some signs up at the golf course. They don't have to be big, splashy signs, but say, yes, we're open for public play. We have a pro shop. We have a restaurant. We have lessons. We have a golf academy. We have club and cart rentals, whatever it is. You know, because we didn't know. We figured that Connemara was the only one that was open to the public. That we, that, and we just guessed on that. We thought all the other ones were going to be private. How would we know? Yeah. Yeah, I think this is your getting ready year. And I think next year you could start saying it. But then when you get here, you better deliver. Remember, it's a promise. I think you can deliver it on the golf. But uh, on the wine, I think you can be really close. I mean, we went out of town in, in the middle of the week at 10 o'clock. The wine tasting, tasting room was open. Plus all the events and everything else. Just fabulous. Yeah. Okay. These were easy questions. Yeah. I'm waiting for yeah. some hard ones. Go ahead. I think uh, so. The only question I have: so you will have a uh, a follow up document. Some we will have. I know. A, I know this. This meeting was recorded, and we'll have comments from from the public. Absolutely. Maybe they couldn't make it to the audience this yes. morning at 9 a.m. So um, we'll, we'll try to do that here in the upcoming weeks, and uh, try to develop a plan of action to move our community forward. But. Um, and, and you're going to be available for follow up questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We've okay. done. Yeah, we've assessed so many places that still, you know, still call us or, or yeah. email, say, well, Roger, what about this? What about this? I never, ever charge a dime for it. We're about making a difference. Yeah, we appreciate it. And, and so, yeah, so you'll get the follow-up document. You'll get in PDF. You'll get hard copies of it. But you'll also have this. Plus, I'm going to send to Darren. Where is Darren? Um, oh, right there. <laughs> um, we will, I'll give you, um, I will email you via Hightail this actual presentation. So you'll actually have the presentation. So if you want to go through there, that's like 400 slides. But you may say, well, I want to go to Kiwanis or Rotary or, and you could take it and make it yours. You'll have the photography. You'll have what we said. Um, you know, and the nice thing is, you know what they always say is the expert always lives somewhere else. I'm sure there's things that you've all said that I just repeated that, that now we made it public. Um, but I didn't see anything negative at all. I didn't feel unsafe, nothing. I think it's a great place. Good. Okay, do we have any questions from the commission members? I think we've got a lot of work to do. We do. We have we a do. lot of work to do. But you know, and it won't cost you a fortune. I, I, I think the biggest, uh, just to give you one more idea, sorry, I don't want to keep going, but wayfinding is not an inexpensive thing to do, of course. I think you'll work with Department of Transportation. I think you need to fund your wayfinding system. It can be decorative so it fits your brand. I would work on, I would start working on logo stuff so that when you do wayfinding for Nicholasville, I'd make Nicholasville, and you could put Wilmore in there as the destination and not the county. And once again, I don't mean any offense to the county, but it's not, we go to cities. We don't go to counties. As visitors or even as places to live, we're looking for cities. And, and so I think there's some things there that you could do. I mean, you've got some great assets. Um, um, they're, they're just, we need, but remember, you will always be judged by your product, not your marketing. That's the bottom line. Here's the other thing, is marketing will bring people to Nicholsville only once. The only thing that ever brings them back is your product. What is the primary thing I want to do while I'm here? Whether it's the wineries, what else do you have for me while I'm here? Restaurants, shops, cool places like Luna's, whatever. And then your amenities like public parking, public restrooms, visitor information, and the people we interact with. That's the only thing that brings them back. 
And those are this, all of this stuff you could do this year. Your wayfinding by the time you get implemented probably be in the next year. It's probably a 14 to 16 month thing. And you need to do that with the county, with Wilmore and with the city and with DOTK DOT. Um, um, but as far as your downtown, that's gonna be a little longer process because you gotta start with property owners. Remember, even if you put zoning over them, they're all grandfathered in, yeah. except for the empty ones. You know, but I think as part of economic development, I think downtown needs to be part of that. That means retail recruitment, not just warehouses and factories and those kinds of things. I mean, you need that. Right. So, okay. Okay. Well, uh, I know we have some members from the community out here in the, in the audience, so if it's acceptable to the commission, does anybody have yeah. any questions for Mr. Brooks? They wanted to what clear up. What's other city? So, yeah. so, good question. And his question, if it wasn't picked up by the mic, is, is about what can the city do to help recruit businesses downtown? You know, that business mix. I, I believe that you should have a zoning overlay over downtown. And we're not trying to kick anybody out. But that future uses of first floor would be restaurants, retail, those type of business. Now, before you go tell a business, we're going to restrict who you can have in your space, we better be there to help you get that tenant, right? That's the trade-off. And so we've actually seen cities, I don't know if you have an economic development nonprofit, if you have an economic development person in the city, I don't know who, what, where, I, I did read in here, um, who, who is quoted in here a lot? Um, Let's see, in here we, we talked about, let's see, let's see, uh, Tim Cross, planning. He, he's our former director of planning. Oh, planning. former, okay. Yeah, but you should, the city should have a person in economic development. I really believe that when you get apartments and condominiums and stuff, that a portion of the land they should, should put in public amenities for their residents and for the city. And in most cities, there are actually ordinances that for the development you do that there is a trade-off. You need to provide some public amenities because you've outgrown your public amenities. I think that's important, that zoning. But, but with economic development, you, I would even, whether you contract with somebody that was a commercial real estate agent to help them recruit, I think you have the business here. How do we get Lunas to come downtown? And I'm just using that for an example. Um, but how do we get some of these businesses in downtown, in these businesses? What can we do to help you recruit a business there? Um, and, then, and then would you buy into this vision? You and not just you, because you can't do it by yourself. You need other people to do it. Remember, we had 20 businesses downtown on there, and you've got like two. So we have 18 to go. Are there enough retail space for that? Um, we have seen that law firms um, actually take the first 10 or 15 feet inside their business and put in a little barista stand. I mean, that counts, you know, if they've got the room to do it. Um, so there's some of those things. We even see even banks now are starting to become non-traditional, you know, where they actually have. We've seen libraries put in coffee shops, stuff like Barnes & Noble did. Um, and so, but I think the city needs to be there to help you find the tenant. And if you agree to that, if you agree to this and can help sell other property owners, we, the city, will do what we can to bring people downtown at least 250 days a year, which means bringing customers to your front door 250 out of 365 days. That means you'll be closed one day, two days a week and still have customers every day in front of your store. What comes first is people there on a consistent base. Where people go to hang out, retailers follow. And right now, they're not hanging out there. Yeah. Make sense? It has to be. We're in the age of public-private partnerships. That's what this is. Yeah, great question. Okay. Does anybody else have any comments, questions? To, to what's that? To oh, yeah. Tenants. Yeah. Um, and they asked how should I spend this money? And I have a public form, so I'll give it. Um, most everybody was thinking very small in my opinion. I, I summed your presentation up in a four minutes, and my idea was you definitely need to anchor. We have Rock Fence Park, which you Yep, 
Yep. That area that So, and they, they looked at me like I was dumb. Well, we have seen cities, we have seen cities spend millions of dollars and make their downtown look fantastic, but they're still as dead as a doornail. At the end of the day, it's what's in the buildings that makes you a draw. The rest is just gingerbread. So most Plain and simple. I mean, can you imagine being a wine and golf destination and having a, a, uh, a little art gallery downtown that is a co-op art gallery, but also wines from these? Remember, I said, you have wineries here? I couldn't find any local wines. I couldn't buy any anywhere. Wouldn't it be great if you had a little retail shop that just did that even? See what I mean? Bring it into downtown. But you're absolutely right. I mean, that's why I said the facade improvements. I love facade grant. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against facade improvements, against beautification, but it's what's in the buildings that makes you a draw. To comment on that, the streetscape project, Mr. Goldie, what was that, 15 years ago? But 15 years ago, I mean, that, that was a start, right? For Nicholasville. Um, I think, you know, like I've, always, I think I've, I've said, I think city government, and tell me if I'm wrong, can help facilitate improvement downtown. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it takes entrepreneurs and risk takers and I've always said Tyler Care, right? I mean, you guys have made an effort to do that. Um, so at the end of the day, that's what it takes. Right? It does. Is that, am, I, am I right on that? It I is. Mean, the, the, the very. Right? We can help facilitate that. You could create a downtown, you could do a master, you could do a Nicholasville downtown master development plan almost kind of like a comprehensive plan, but it's like, here's what, how we envision our downtown in five years from now, with drawings and everything. And that, and, but what's really, and then this is the kind of businesses we need to recruit into downtown to make this happen. And then we will bring people to the front door. You will work with, you know, the beautification, all of those other things are all part of that plan. 
and you use that as a document to help recruit those people. But you also need somebody to go knock on their doors wherever they're at. Because right now, you're not in control of what happens in those buildings. Right. You're not. I mean, that's, right. it's private sector. It's tax-based. We want it to be private sector. We want a different focus. And like you said, I mean, if you got all these warehouses here and they're all saying, yeah, I went in your downtown and it's dead, so I'm going to move in Lexington. And I heard the big con about living in Nicholasville is the commute between the two. That's the one negative. People that live here and commute into Lexington for work or vice versa. And so I, I really do believe that you want them to live here, and to do that, you've got to create a place where they go, this is such a cool little downtown. It doesn't need to be bigger. It just needs to be programmed with activities and the right retail mix. Roger, I just wanted to comment on, I mean, by us having a state road running as our main street, yes. how big of an issue is that? Should our focus be more towards going a block out one way or another, um, like has been suggested, and yeah. like is kind of going on now with the public well, which is one block off of Maine? Yeah. Or yeah. should we, should our priority be in extending out, or should our priority be in reaching out to the current owners on our, of our Main Street So I, I would absolutely reach out to current. What I would do is create a vision document. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be big and say, here's what we're imagining downtown. Even just showing them that last part that I told you about downtown programming it, all of these different things, and say, if we did this, would you move your business downtown? Would you allow us to help you recruit the right mix, recruit a new tenant in there? You know, because some of these places, we put restaurants in there, do they really have grease trap? Do they have the infrastructure yeah. to even be able to do it? It's a historic downtown. Yeah. So there's some of those things. Um, we did think that the east, east part of downtown made more sense than going up on the hill. Mm -hmm. um, we did think so where the, what is it, the, the common well, what is it? Uh, the public well. Yeah, the public well. Where that is, I mean, that's more open there, be easier to do. However, we do want some activity on, but you've got Performance Park. If you take out the condemned building and you made that into a public space, and if both the buildings on each side said, well, we're going to put some kind of food in there and we're going to open it up on the sides, that could become a little public plaza. I don't know. We've seen cities where they go in and go through the condemnation. You, by the way, you're not taking anything away. You're paying them their assessed value. Um, and so it's not like you're taking property, but in that case, you'd have, you have places where you could do multiple things. This, where this picture is taken. So you could have, you could have, you could have some activities here, some activities here, and then have a bigger area back kind of on the east side. It does not all have to be right on Main. Because we have worked in many cities where they say, state, we want you to deed back the highway to the city. The problem is you would be responsible for maintenance but not just through downtown, all the way up, both ends of business 27, because state won't chop out the middle section and give it to you. In your case, I didn't really see that as being that major nightmare. Normally, I have to go and say, narrow your streets, widen your sidewalks. You already have narrow streets. Unfortunately, you also have narrow sidewalks, and they're not easily level. I don't think that's a major issue. Um, I would just let it be a state highway for now. I mean, I, you could make front, you could still have bit blade signs, you could still do some beautification, um, but I think your gathering areas would be like Performance Park, maybe down on the Commonwealth, you know, all of those areas, and I think you'd have multiple spaces. I don't think you have to have one big plaza. I think you could have, oh, I wonder what's going on over there, up at, was it Rock Fence Park up on the hill? Is that the one up on top of the hill that has the fence? There's a little playground there. I mean, you could have activities there. You could have performance park. You could have, you know, wherever. You know, you could have all kinds of things going on in multiple locations that are all easily walkable. And, and here's another issue that I see, and I may be stepping on some people's toes here, and I don't mean to, but it's just the reality. Um, we have a joint parks and recreation boards with us and with the county. And, okay. and prior to January, Wilmore was also included. But we have different visions for where we want to go. Um, we at the city of Nicholasville are a little more eager to improve our current parks and invest yes. in our current parks yes. than maybe some of the others in, in this joint uh, endeavor are. So, um, I mean, it's I've actually suggested that 
you know, maybe we have our own parks and rec uh, that, in that Nicholasville was, yeah. and let the county and Wilmore do their own as well. Um, just because our, our, we don't seem to be on the same page with where we want to go and, or what we're willing to put into. Right. And we've done a lot of work with parks and recs that are separate from cities like you have. And, and you are absolutely 100% right. Invest in what you got first and make it better. Make what you got first, make it better. It looks like we build parks and then we just let them go to rot. Yeah. That, that doesn't work. You gotta make what you got better. Because right now they just didn't seem to be very well maintained. They're starting to get dilapidated and it's sending an image of Nicholasville that's a little lower in than what, who you are. Right. And, and I think you gotta invest in what you have. Don't build more when you can't even take care of what you already have. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, you I, the, like Lake Mingus, I was just, man, that could be so incredible, but it's yeah, kind of there, but yeah, it's just, I, I, or, or even the Aquatic Center, I mean, I, I, I just think that, I think that was the low point was your Parks and Rec, I, and I'm really sorry, and I don't mean to step on toes either, but anybody that's going to move here, they're going to see the same thing we saw, and they're probably going to come up with similar conclusions. Is this a place I really want to live? Yeah. In terms of quality and quantity. Yeah. So, uh, so and, and we have seen cities create their own parks and rec, um, and, then, and then do a combination of the two. But then, once again, you're talking about city budgets, and you're talking about other departments, and, I mean, it's... You know, it's one of those push-shove. When it comes to downtowns, we, we think Parks and Rec should manage your downtown if, if the city's going to manage these public spaces. It should be Parks and Rec, not Public Works, not City Council. Or it could be a business improvement district you create, you know, that, that they have a contract with the city for a buck a year to program all these spaces like what you see in this picture in Performance Park. You know, and it falls under the city's umbrella insurance. So there's all kinds of ways to do this. But, but we like Parks and Recs because it's about beautification, it's about curb appeal, it's about quality of life. Um, and so we try not to turn these over to like public works departments. You know, they're really infrastructure related, no offense. It's still important, storms, drainage, and all the other things. Yeah. But I, I do think that's one area that needs great improvement. But yeah, yeah if, if you're on a different page, then you say, well, I guess maybe we have to take some things into our own control. And you need both, quality and quantity. Yeah. You've and, way outgrown what you've got. And just so the folks in the audience know, uh, we have in budgeted quite a bit of money out of our ARPA funds and, and our general fund budget towards improving uh, parks. And we've got some exciting things happening with a splash pad going in at Lake Mingo. We've widened the uh, walking trails there. Um, and, you know, we've with the performance park mm -hmm. we've got concerts there every month now oh. starting uh, with may the 5th um tonight at down at the public well there's a concert outdoor concert down Fantastic. there as well so we we had a group of would you say 30 or 40 of us uh, that went and visited other towns in kentucky that have been successful at revitalizing their downtown area. So we've got a good group of business leaders uh, and politicians that are excited about this. So we've started, and you know we're we're working on it, but yeah. we've you know we got a long way to go based on. You I know, would what get. You've I would. Uh, I'd create Destination Nicholasville. It's it's not another nonprofit. It's a group. I I would probably have 50 percent of that group be millennials. I mean that is your mm -hmm. future. Um, and of course, it would have city, it'd have county, it'd have whoever you know your players are, <laughs> some property owners, um, and uh, and then you start. I mean, and your whole goal is how do we program this place? Yeah. How do we program activities? You know, and 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 we want to make it a cool place to come. I mean, we couldn't find any cultural depth. I didn't know about any concerts at Performance Park. I we actually we did see a few things on Facebook. Yeah. Um, but, but other than that, you have to understand, we didn't really see it on Instagram and TikTok and all the other where mm -hmm. social media people are. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't see much on YouTube at all, which was disappointing. But things like splash pads, I think they should be right downtown. You know? Yeah. So, and but I yeah. Facade improvements. How do you, you did mention we, we did 
did do uh, budgeted half a million dollars for small business improvements. For Great. Structural, structural improvements and facade improvements Great. on the downtown Okay, block. perfect. So uh, I think that's one of, the, one yeah. of the ways the city is making an effort. Right? We, we've, even like, seen, we've even seen cities do facade easements. Because, you know, it's really tricky putting public money into private property. That's yes. always a tricky right. double-edged right. sword. But in places like Huntsville, Texas, they actually did facade easements. They gave the city an easement for their facade so you could put public money into the facades. Um, rather than zero interest loans or, you know, some partial grants that are matching grants. And those things are all fine. But, but, and I'm not against facade improvements. I just think that you need to concentrate on what's in the buildings before you make it look pretty. Have a plan. But I really think food, art, those, and, and, and entertainment are what you need in downtown. Yeah. You need a place, and it's really geared to evening hours. Absolutely. Where we go after work on weekends. Yeah. And yeah. Yes. <laughs> And one thing is, Charlotte mentioned that she's redoing the website, redoing a lot of her stuff. After today, you might want to hold off a little bit. You, see, you heard brand direction. Like, I don't know where you're going yet, but you may say, well, wait, can we do... You know, she really represents the whole county, but I'm really saying for the county, I would really promote these cities, you know? And then you can put Nicholasville, Wilmore in beautiful Jasmine County, Kentucky. You know, I think that's always a great bull byline. Um, but, but those are some things that, that you work at. And like I said, the goal is 250 days worth of activity downtown. So you say, well, we're going to bring in 30. If somebody else would bring in 20 days, pretty soon we're going to add up. Because retailers say, because bringing people to my front door as a retailer 50 days of the year is not enough to make me, help me survive. That's where that 250, and that's proven science. 250 days worth of activity is what will sustain a retailer. So what comes first is people downtown on a consistent basis, and then it's easy to attract the retailers. And you know, several of the uh, cities that we visited, in addition to having someone in charge of tourism and economic development, they did have a, like a downtown stakeholders yes. group. Yes. You that met on a regular basis. Yeah, and you could have, you could become part of Main Street USA, which yes. we're big proponents of. Um, they usually require a full-time director. Um, I think downtown should have a business improvement district. This is where the property owners and merchants are actually helping fund some of this. Remember I said public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. So they need to have skin in the game too, not just who they bring in, but what happens downtown? And so creating business improvement districts is a great way to help bring them in there. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, we've even seen cities say, we'll help you fund the bid, and then, and then they have to determine how much they're going to raise. Are we going to raise $10,000 a year or $100,000 a year? What do we want to do with, what do we want? You know, and usually it'd probably be thirty dollars to $50,000 a year, and that'd go a long way towards programming. And say that's what we're going to do with it, you know. And and uh, but I think these are all part of a downtown plan. But yes, you could become Main Street. You create your own downtown association. That's basically what a bid a bid is. Improvement district. I would actually do the whole. I would probably go. I probably would. 
maybe go a block past CVS and then the other way, you get into residential right at the other end. I wouldn't do way up to, I, you really need to concentrate from CVS to, you know, to uh, what, what the old, whatever's down there at that end. Just that, that, yeah. that area. But it could be, you know, east a little bit to a couple of blocks. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a good transition zone there on that side. Yeah. That doesn't have people walking up and down hills and narrow streets and all that. You know, that'd be easy. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Brooks, we appreciate it. All right. Thank you, for Thank you so very much. We really, really enjoyed our time here. We can't wait to come back. Giving us a great assessment. Look forward to following up with you and you know, developing it. All right. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, commission members, we have no further questions. No further questions from the audience will adjourn this meeting.